I hope lunch was good. It's always too short, um, but we're very well. Come on stage. Um, we're about to start the, the afternoon. So again, welcome back to Bootstrap Bradford and all the Blind AI conference. And the morning was very busy. A lot of topics. We have a lot more coming this afternoon for you. Um, but this is probably the the panel that's been the most in the news as of late. So it's very appropriate. It's about the media and. The question really is going to be, is AI going to be destroying the media or really reinventing the media? So with that, I'll let you with an amazing panel. Um, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Alex Salkiever. I wrote, uh, there I am on the panel, but uh, the slides, I guess, are coming up in a second. So we were going to do a five-minute lightning tour of AI and media and looking at opportunities and risks. Um, as Ben said, this is a particularly interesting time for media right now because as you're following the Facebook hearings, for example, you're hearing about fake news. As you're also looking at venture investments, when you look at companies like Facebook, Google, Twitter, Snapchat, the vast majority of money that's been made in these home run investments has come out of media companies really in the last decade or so. Um, so there's tremendous opportunities in media, and many of these media companies are also some of the biggest proponents or the biggest developers of AI tools, Facebook, Google. Um, another unicorn company, BuzzFeed, which Eli works at, uh, is one of those. So very quickly, let's run through some stuff. Um, AI and media, savior or destroyer? This is actually a real news story from a fake news outlet. So this is about a Chinese news service that's using robots, or essentially AI, to write stories in about one second. These are from structured data, so they're very fast. Um, they're usually sports scores or box scores or maybe something like an election result. Um, Sputnik is a Russian news service that's by the Russian state government, uh, and often it pushes stories which are kind of weird. Um, and that's why I thought this slide was kind of apropos, because it really hits all the bases of strange things happening in media in one fell swoop. Um, so, also a quick reality check on media. Um, how ready is media for AI? And what can AI actually do in media? And the reality is a fairly limited amount now, but something that's going to be growing a lot more quickly. So this was actually a survey of 350 AI experts. I think it was from the NIPS, concert, uh, NIPS conference. And what they basically said is that if we're not going to have an AI that can write even a high school essay for another 10 years or so. And the New York Times bestseller is 30 years out, probably more. So to give you a sense, that means that right now in media, in terms of actual creation of media, AI is very nation. Um, so these are some themes to think about when you're thinking about AI and media. And that it is, yes, reshaping the way media works very quickly at the lower level and probably will swim upstream. Um, those are some robo reporters, jingles, database. There are all some areas where media is now being impacted right now with AI. Um, there's also new business models that are coming out of AI and media, which are very interesting. Uh, we'll talk about those a little bit quickly. And last, some risks of co-opting AI and future efficiencies. So as I said, a lightning tour. It looks like I have about two, three minutes left. So AI was shaping the, the way media works. Uh, this is actually a news article from BuzzFeed where a reporter who has a science and coding background but is not an AI expert used some AI tools, uh, random forest algorithms, to identify DEA and military surveillance planes looking at public data. So you can see more and more we will have these AI tools to make media better. I'd call it super, uh, sort of superpowers of AI and media. Um, it will automate more and more complex, uh, more of the less complex work that we're seeing. So as I mentioned, box scores, uh, the Washington Post now uses AI to cover many elections. Um, also things like data visualizations that are rote. You'll see AI is doing more of that so human reporters on the top can do more and more interesting things. This one was particularly interesting to me because actually the bottom image is a podcast I appeared on where I suggested that they use an AI driven service for jingle creation. Um, and it was fascinating because I had never actually heard the products and they did it and it was really amazingly good and this is for $20. So you pick a number of songs you like, you tell the service, hey, I'm interested in these songs, 
I want this mood, and it will give you a jingle. Now think of this for a second, what this means. Human musicians have generally done this in the past, and this completely replaces human musicians. Granted on the lower end, but a really interesting use case. Um, new ways to create content. This is a, an app called Game Changer, which is primarily used for youth sports events. And what it does is it has coaches or parents input data in a structured format, which is then fed to an AI, which writes recap stories of sports events. And you'll see this published in all, in not only in the app, but you also see this published uh, online lots of places. And Robbie's company, Automated Insights, or is the company founded, actually does this for uh, various properties, including Yahoo Sports and some of their Sunday, uh, Sunday football leagues, right? Um, so risks. AI tools can co-opt the news. Um, we will see more and more of this because increasingly AI is getting good enough and easy enough to modify images to create things that look like something but are actually entirely fake. Uh, and we're already getting a lot of this, but it's going to get far worse and far more automated. Um, not only will we be co-opting existing images, but we'll be creating out of whole cloth things that are really, really different from what we had imagined. So taking something that's an image of night and turning it into day, or back and forth. Taking a city that looks like one thing and turning it into a different city. Or taking a person's face and turning it into someone else's face. Um, so on the upside, unlocking news efficiencies. Uh, AI will let us do things like cover every election in the entire country and to have a pretty decent output of something that someone can read. AI makes hyper-local journalism viable again. So most of you probably have some local newspaper that's struggling, doesn't have enough ads. Um, AI will fill it with content that is probably almost as good as what the local journalists who are paid almost nothing are doing. Um, lastly, AI takes on fake news. And if I skip a couple slides, forgive me. Um, this is a project that's coming out of the Stanford uh, Knight Fellowship Program. It's an amazing project that basically will fingerprint fake news using a bunch of AI algorithms on uh, you know, deep learning things that they've set up, as well as signatures of what a good news story looks like in a bad news story, number of interviews in the story, uh, length of the story, site type of prose, also inbound links from Google and it will ideally give us a rating on stories and help us understand with a confidence interval whether it's fake news or not. So that's the lightning tour. Um, if you have feedback on any of these thoughts, I'm around the conference, please uh, feel free to give them to me. With that, I want to start the panel uh, by introducing my esteemed panelists. So we have Robbie Allen, um, forgive me, I always blank on last names when I get on stage who is the CEO of Infinia ML and the Executive Chairman of Automated Insights. Um, Robbie, you can tell us a little bit about what you do and what AI does at your company, and then we'll go to Gilad next. Great, thanks. So Infinity ML is a machine learning company. We help Fortune 500 companies deploy machine learning in their environments. Um, prior to Infinity ML, I was the founder, and now I'm the Executive Chairman at Automated Insights, which I started in 2007. Uh, we were one of the first natural language generation companies, and that's just kind of fancy talk for taking structured data and turning it into content. Um, we worked with a number of companies over the years. Um, I like to say that I was selling AI before it was cool to sell AI, which wasn't very cool. It was actually really hard um, back in the 2008, 9, and 10 time frame. Um, back then, you tried to sell AI, and people looked at you funny. Uh, four or five years later of autonomous cars and AlphaGo and all these other things and you go in and, and sell and people think it's not magical enough. So we've really kind of come all the way around on that. But uh, lots of great stuff to talk about with what we're doing in media. And Gilad is actually a former VC, a veteran data hacker, I would say, from some of your Medium posts, who now runs the data science, including the AI program inside of BuzzFeed. Yeah, so, hey everyone, I'm Gilad. I lead the data science team at BuzzFeed, and I'm incredibly excited to be here. Um, what we do at BuzzFeed, we're a, a media company. Uh, we focus on entertainment, news. Uh, we have hundreds of millions of very dedicated users who, read, who consume our content, both on our own platforms and across distributed platforms. So we're obviously very active on Facebook, on Instagram, on Snapchat. Uh, on YouTube, and I think that the common thread around the company is we use data 
everywhere to inform decisions, to make smarter decisions, to increase efficiencies. Um, and so specifically the data science team is really, we build technologies like personalization technologies, like recommender systems, ranking systems to inform what's trending, uh, and really try to show where content should be place it, placed and match it to the right audience. Uh, but we also use data to inform, sort of on the BI side, inform both the business as well as the content creation side. So what are the themes that we're picking up in terms of the content, the type of content, the formats that are working, et cetera. So specifically with machine learning and neural networks, we found uh, incredibly impactful places to leverage the advancement in artificial intelligence. Uh, and two large areas, one around content, the content creation side, so systems that help uh, one understand performance, understand performance of a, a, a cluster of articles, so a theme, but also uh, help spark creativity. So identifying certain kind of content trend and uh, um, showing it, highlighting it to the right person in the company. So on the content creation side, there are a, a number of places where we utilize neural networks. And then on the curation side, there are many, uh, from fully automated to many human in the loop style systems where we use uh, historical data to then help our curators help inform their decision on which item should go where. Whether it's hundreds of Facebook pages, where it's placements on site, on apps, on distributed platforms. So the panel is of course, savior or destroyer. Uh, I'd like to ask each of you to talk a little bit about what you think are the good side or the potential positives of AI, machine learning, neural networks and media, and the potential negatives. What are the risks? What are the things that we should worry about? Since both, both of you have either built businesses or are so close in the space. Yeah, so my take on this is, and again, I've been doing interviews around, um, is the end of journalism near, um, since 2010. And my approach hasn't changed since then. And it's really not either, it's we're gonna be an ally. And, and in fact, I have these slides when I give a talk on the, the future of, of jobs and journalism where you know, automated insights um, you know, every year generates more and more content. Now we generate more than a billion pieces of content every year. Every year I do more and more interviews about the future of the workforce and journalism. All those lines are going up. And then the next slide is the number of jobs lost due to an implementation of automated insights, and it's a flat line on zero. <laughs> um, and so we, you know, we just haven't seen it. You know, I think it's, it's easy to jump to one extreme or the other, um, it, but across the board, in terms of the things that, that we're doing with companies, with media companies especially, it's more additive. It's, it's enabling them to scale in a way that they couldn't do before. It's almost, and in fact, it's in no case are we taking away jobs or, or doing something that, in fact, oftentimes the journalists are thankful that we're automating things like earnings reports so that they don't have to do them anymore. And Gilad, we had actually talked about how it's, your systems are helping the human reporters do more and more, be more efficient. Uh, you also had some concerns about ways that AI might not work so well in media over time. So. Yeah, so, so I would say just generally, I think places where we can introduce efficiencies and automate very laborious work, we're very interested in that, we, and we, we invest, we build those kinds of systems. So we think about uh, this, this idea of squeezing more juice out of the orange, you know, when you try to make orange juice, there's always more that you can squeeze. We create, we invest a lot in content. We have hundreds of people around the world making amazing content. And a lot of the content gets published once, Somewhere, and within a day or two it dies down. Now what are ways in which we can reuse this effort? And I think that's where we can use machine learning, a lot of cases where we think about adaptation. Taking a video, turning it into a, into a post, turning it into a shorter video for Instagram. Uh, how do we adapt the frame, taking a, a story and tweaking it slightly? How do we translate to different markets where it's not just autom automated translation, but really understanding the frame that would suit uh, be suitable in that market. And we, we're already doing, we have a bunch of tools internally that leverage historical data to help uh, curators, editors make those decisions. So squeezing more out of the orange I think is really interesting and we're, we're hyper-focused on many of these cases. But I think, I think often, too often, as technologists, and I'm also biased in this case, we, we tend to have this techno-utopianism where you know, AI is the solution. I mean, if you've been hearing uh, Congress hearings the last few days, I don't know how many times Zuck 
mentioned, referenced AI as the solution to misinformation, right? Um, where I think like, one question we need to consistently ask ourselves is at what cost, right? And so we talk about these systems, these, these massive feeds like uh, Facebook, like Twitter, uh, like YouTube, search system, search uh, for content, where they're hyper-personalized, they're, I mean, content's being ranked and highly optimized and matched to users, but we have no way to hold anything accountable. And we have no way to understand really, really where the potential harm is until it's flagged and then there's a controversy. So all these companies now, all these massive content companies that are sort of developing AI are hiring tens of thousands of content curators and humans to actually go through and filter out all the all the stuff they don't that that is problematic and so think of the, the this this the consequence of this hyper personalization and the scale but now you're employing 20,000 uh, people in the Philippines you're paying them almost nothing and you're not accounting for the psychological harm that they that you may inflict on them by constantly uh, having to filter out and, and look at all this problematic content. So I think there, there are all these unintended consequences. We should be asking ourselves as we build these technologies, how do we, um, how do we add ways to account for that? A question that's related to that, which I'd like to ask Robbie first and then you can second, is um, we should expect that all of the people who are creating news that they may want to use to hurt people or to manipulate things well, that will have access to very good ML, very good AI tools, we're assuming state actors, things like that. And first part of the question is, are we actually ready to apply some sort of counter AI to stop that, to prevent media from essentially being degraded by these sorts of efforts? And secondly, um, you know, how would you frame that or how would you want to think about that? Since both of you think very deeply about how media is constructed, consumed, uh, and at the, the level of AI, how it works generating media or understanding media. Yeah, I mean, I think your question is, you know, mostly around fake news, right? And Correct. I, at, because at a, we can say fake news. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> at a certain level, you know, to me, it, it all comes down to the source, right? So in terms of the type of content that we're able to create for media companies, um, it only has an impact because of the distribution that's behind it. So again, we're working with the Associated Press and other large media outlets, and I'm sure they're able to distribute content. One of the unintended consequences that, that we found was when we started doing earnings reports for the AP, we were able to help them go from covering 200 companies a quarter to over 3,000 companies a quarter. That means that you know two to 3,000 companies every quarter were now getting covered in a way that they weren't before. The AP and Stanford did a study to figure out what was the impact of that on the financial markets. <coughs> Turns out, vo trading volumes went up significantly for all of those companies that previously weren't being covered. Just as soon as the AP started co producing these financial earnings reports through us, um, so there are all these sort of interesting things that even if we sat back and thought about it, I don't know if we'd necessarily come up with that as a potential unintended consequence. Again, a lot of these you can't necessarily see. That's why they're unintended. Um, you know, in terms of fake news, again, you know, there's going to be things that you know we can fight AI with AI. There's definitely some options there, but ultimately, you know, it, the, the trusted media sources will continue to be trusted, and they can take advantage of this in ways to help, not necessarily hurt. I'd say, I, I think like one thing as, as a media company that has hundreds of millions of, of dedicated users, we have to be conscious of our power to draw attention to topics and know when not to use it. I think that's, we're seeing all these, uh, all the, this information warfare effectively take place and memes that uh, start on 4chan or Reddit and make their way to Twitter and then are amplified by media outlets, when should we not cover them? When should we not direct attention to them? I think that's, that's a core question and the newsroom sort of battles with that a lot. What, isn't, what should we not cover? I think with, uh, with personalization, we've seen um, that, that one of the outcomes is, is increased polarization. All right, so if you constantly feed uh, you, certain users a point of view, whether it's fake or, or false or just sort of tainted, you can choose what part of the story to highlight and what part of the story to just not really talk about, not surface. Um, what happens to people's point of views when they're sort of day after day fed with a certain point in the narrative? So you see this increased polarization. Uh, and the question is, what can you do? Well, what kind of uh, optimization uh, and, and what kind of functions would we want to optimize for? 
well, maybe not only click-through rates and, and uh, shares, uh, maybe we, we'd want to understand who are bridging factors within this network. Uh, some experiments that we've run in the newsroom at BuzzFeed uh, around uh, identifying multiple points of views around a prescient topic. We call it outside the bubble and there's this module on the site that really tries to identify different points of views on a topic and highlight them even if they're not necessarily you know, our own. Another question that relates to this to a certain degree is uh, Fake news, obviously, a big problem. Filter bubble, another problem. Also driven by uh, AI personalization. Uh, you know, how do we apply this inside of media? Because uh, media is interested in this personalization to really either eliminate or mitigate or extend filter bubbles so that we're exposing people to more things and not just echo chambering everything. I mean, I I, I think a lot a lot of it. Um, stems from uh, the fact that the experience of consuming information now happens in uh, a few sort of very large platforms. And I think the more control that media companies can have over that, uh, over that experience, uh, may the, the, the better they are able to sort of affect and, and effectively bridge across these very polarized uh, networks. And what, what I mentioned with Outside the Bubble is one experiment that we thought was really interesting and it has been working nicely. Uh, but there are many ways in which we can change our objective functions and say rather than just showing you the content that you know, is adjacent in your network, start to identify bridging content. And related to that, Robbie, as we move towards this type of better semantic understanding of content, um, where are we in that right now? Uh, I mean, because it's essentially a pattern recognition problem, but also the bridging problem that you is talking about. And, and well, how far away are we from both this better semantic recognition and also uh, actual natural language generation that becomes more similar to what humans would expect as quality uh, content? Well, again, I think for structured you know, data that, that we're turning into to content. That sound, that meets sort of the, the human test today, right? In fact, I, you would be surprised how often you're actually reading content that was fully automated and you didn't know it. Um, Can you, you give know, us a couple additional examples, like some surprise things? Yeah, well, so for example, we generate all the recaps for minor league baseball. Um, and, you know, a lot of people don't know about that. You know, if, if they don't put um, an indication of where the content's coming from, you know, you're just reading a recap and it sounds like anybody else's recap, right? So, in fact, for Automated Insights, the goal has always been to generate content that sounds like a person wrote it. Now, that's for, you know, qualitative uh, or quantitative analysis, right? That's where the sort of state of the art with NLG is now, you know, if for, as far as qualitative analysis, that's a whole other ball game. And you actually had a slide that showed, you know, essays, um, you know, full-length articles, books, that is much further out, right? So um, automated insights is more of an expert system, you know, using bits and pieces of machine learning. Um, my new company is doing machine learning, and then my research that I've been doing for my PhD is to try to combine machine learning with natural language generation. Why did I pick that as a research topic? Is because we're not anywhere close to being able to achieve that now. And in fact, lots of examples that you may see where people try to generate, you know, a Harry Potter novel. Um, you know, it's just not anywhere close yet. And in fact, most of the current techniques we have, especially on the machine learning side, aren't close to being able to produce something um, that would pass the human test for qualitative analysis. Quantitative is pretty much solved, but qualitative is still gonna be a ways out. So Gil, I had a question that your earlier comments on how you're using machine learning and neural networks inside of the organization, it made me wonder if you had kind of a wish list of things that would help you be a better news org from a tool standpoint, from things you would either give to salespeople or marketers or reporters, what, what would be a few things on that wish list? I think a lot, uh, like we're a content company, and so we constantly grapple with metadata. Like that's our biggest sort of issue and, and our biggest, I think, potential uh, for benefit. And the, I know there's been a lot of advancement in sort of metadata, especially around rich media, um, but it never quite, gets it right. So we can, we, we use a, a recurrent ne neural network to identify word embeddings for titles of our articles, but they don't really grasp what the, the article is about. We um, use uh, image recognition to identify 
tags from videos or images, but again, they can say there's a dog here, but they don't get what the piece is about. And really, a lot, a lot of our content is sort of culturally aware. But I think I would, I would be interested in um, metadata or services that are smart enough to really have a better grasp of cultural references um, of not just the celebrity's name, but sort of the show, the emotions that are sparked, and, and really, really grasp and understand that. And that's, that's something that we, we don't have. Yeah, well, that's a super interesting point. Extending on that, Robbie, if you could build a wish list of capabilities for natural language generation or just things that would make your life much easier and better, uh, what would the kind of things be that are missing right now? Yeah, you know, this is actually the fundamental question, right? So when I think about my own research, like what is the ideal state? Like what is it that we would like to have in terms of natural language generation? And to me, the answer is not so obvious, right? There's lots of different applications you could apply, but, you know, it's there has to be some sense of inspiration. If you want AI to be, you know, doing breaking news, for example, there still has to be a source for where that data is collected and it maybe creates a story out of it. Um, again, we already kind of handled the quantitative aspect of it. Another example could be, all right, for a given topic, um, you know, you want to be able to automatically generate a story that maybe has a new point of view on that topic, an opinion piece, something like that. Um, you know, that's to me one of the exciting things. AI opinion piece, that sounds yes. amazing. That's right. Yeah. Um, well, and I think that's one of the exciting things about this space is that over time, it's not just, there's not just one problem that can be solved. There's actually lots of different applications for applying NLG. Well, I think we're just about out of time on the panel. Um, I wanted to say thank you everybody for listening and hopefully this was useful and interesting to you. It's a very dynamic field. It's going to be changing quite a bit. So please, as they say in the news business, uh, stay tuned. <laughs>
Um, our AI mostly works with hedge funds, wealth management companies, RIAs, uh, and the AI actually outputs explanation for each trade or investment that it does. Uh, so you are bringing a level of interpretability to previously unexplainable black box quant models, um, and we just expose it in product form via an API, and yeah, that's, uh, that's what else we do. So Shish, we all know what Capital One does, but what, in, what do you do in Cap at Capital One? Uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Ashish Pansal. Um, if you have a banking relationship with Capital One, if you have a card or a bank account, thank you for your business. Uh, I have to start with that. Uh, though it's not company policy. Um, uh, I, there, is, there are many things that we do with AI specifically. I want to highlight a couple. Um, using conversational uh, agents, and we have a gender neutral chatbot called Eno, how can we have better conversations with customers' financial Health is, is an important topic. It's uh, befuddling to a lot of customers. How can we make this better? As an example, we have a product called Second Look. Um, if you see an extra generous tip uh, suddenly appearing on your credit card bill, we might send you an alert. Um, that's an example of intelligence at work uh, in the background, helping you, taking care of your money for you. Um, explainability, I think we've touched on that. That's very, very important for us. We are a regulated business. We want to make sure that we uh, treat our customers with fairness and equality. And we have clear line of sight on making decisions uh, related to their credit and other, other financial aspects. So cool. is it, in a nutshell, there's a few things that we do with AI right now. Cool. And uh, Xavier, your business is quite different from everyone else's here. Right. And, uh, maybe you can just give us 30 seconds on uh, Yes. So my name is Xavier Le Gros, and uh, I'm the VP of Product Development at Trusted Insight. And we're a small uh, venture capital firm and a social network as well for people that invest in uh, alternative assets. Uh, let me tell you why we have to use UI, AI. Um, if you look at the data from last year, for instance, uh, from PitchBook, and think of PitchBook as like a, an expensive uh, crunch base, I guess, <laughs> but there were around like 14,000 deals that happened in 2017 in venture capital. And if you have to go through all of that data, and even if you go back and you say, you know, I'm just going to look at, you know, at uh, Series A or you know, maybe C uh, kind of deals, uh, uh, which is still a large number, you need to build some kind of AI to make sense of like, you know, all the different companies out there and to make sense of like, you know, all the different type of investments that you can make. Um, and this is what we're building and how we're using AI uh, at Trusted Insight to really make sense of you know, the list of investment and companies that are requesting funds uh, and see if we can actually build patterns and prediction models on top of that. So um, a lot of startups when they first start uh, in, in any sort of application of machine learning uh, they have a data bootstrapping problem. They need something to train their models. And when you don't have a lot of customers, you can't use their data. Um, I'd be interested in, in sort of talking through any examples of how you may have solved that. You know, some of you at the bigger companies, it's, it was pretty straightforward. You got it from your customers. Um, but maybe, Sean Oak um, or Xavier, how you sort of solved the data bootstrap problem in the beginning, or at least one or two ways in which you found uh, a way to get data that you Get it, get it as quickly as you could. Sure. So, I mean, in our case, um, we don't have any data of our own, right? So, mm -hmm. we um, we mostly go. So, our AI mostly goes to like filings, so SEC filings, which are a ton. Like, there's like just a crazy number of SEC filings out there. So, all the Qs, Ks, um, the individual stock tick data on like individual tickers and companies, um, and then you get to a level where you end up wanting to like contextualize some of the information with some of some of the all data providers, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you're in a position to do that because the AI to like unsupervised learning and you know word embeddings and Bayesian deep learning and you know all the stuff that is described is able to properly contextualize and put it in a form where um, the end customer can actually understand why that decision is being taken regardless of whether regardless of whether it's a two second trade or like a six month investment trade. Um, so that's how we use data. Um, and we also work with all data firms which I'm happy to go explain you know later on this. So you just bootstrap with a bunch of public data. And Xavier in your case, you've you've managed to create this way uh, where it's sort of a give a give to get model in a way is in you get contributions of data from a lot of people that use your product and I think in the early days it's perhaps tempting for a startup to think about selling their data as opposed to just keeping it to themselves and using it to develop their product and perhaps you've had some discussions along the way um, about that trade-off and I'd be interested to know how much you yeah, thought about so that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
selling data originally may be like you know, a quick way of making some money, but at the end of the day for your business, you want to keep that data obviously and enrich it. Uh, and so in our case, for instance, we're looking at different data sets. Uh, there is public data that you can get, you know, there's very CC filings, for instance, that everybody can access. Um, and then, you know, there's paid data. So in this scenario, like, you know, I'll tell you, we are paying for some data to get information about certain type of startups. Um, and then what's important is that, you know, you, you need to add value on top of that data. So what we've built as well is kind of like, you know, ways and features for other people to kind of give us their data and say, hey, you know, you guys built this feature that enables me to have a better insight into my investments, I'm going to give you like you know a certain set of data, um, and then what's great in our in our scenario is like because of our investments, we get first-hand information as well about specific companies in our portfolios, and so the way to think about this is that we really have those four different pillars of information uh, that we join and you know build modeling on top of it. Cool. Um, so. Another way to get data when you're first starting is obviously from your customers, uh, but in financial services it's pretty hard because most of your customers are regulated, they have PRI data and whatever else. Um, I know ASD works with a lot of financial services customers of course, and um, I'd be interested in understanding sort of how you talk customers through what you do and don't keep, what you do and don't get, and basically getting them comfortable with the fact that you're going to be at least handling, if not keeping, in your case, perhaps, a lot of their data. So, and, and this sort of goes to like sales hacks, basically, um, yeah. because it's hard in FinTech. Yeah, so um, how you hasten the sales cycle in FinTech, you know, I wish I knew this, the action secret of that, I would make a lot more money. But there are some things that we learned along the way that would make it easier. Um, some of them is really going to the business instead of going to the innovation side of the house, just kind of not what you would normally assume because innovation is open to trying out new technologies. But we found that that route took us, um, took us to the pilots faster and not necessarily to the production deal. So if you're in this business that we are in and you're trying to break into financial services with an enterprise product, um, the best thing we've learned is to go to the heart of the business, to the business leader, and show that the business can now take the value of AI much faster and get value from it. And that has really helped us get the conversion faster. Um, the data issue always crops up. Security is a big issue in all of these institutions, and we have to go through these security reviews that are pretty intense. Um, we have to take the data. There's no way around it. There's no way of avoiding it. We do take the data in, do feature generation, and we have sort of this next set of data. Um, but what we have done with the banks is go through a very deep uh, security review with them on and on over and over again as we have gotten more and more of the larger customers, the third and the fourth and the fifth has gotten uh, quicker for us because they know since we work with HSBC, we probably will work with them as well. Okay. Ashish, maybe from the other side of the house, you know, when you are looking at a startup or working with a startup um, and they're going to touch Capital One's data, I mean, what do you want to hear from them early on in the sales process or what, where do they tend to fail in the sales process? You know, is it at the pen testing stage? Is it, is it later on? Where, where do they fail? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, Capital One works with a number of startups and uh, we've made some interesting acquisitions as well. We acquired Notch, a machine learning startup based out of Richmond. Last year we acquired Paribus, uh, which uh, looks for discounts for purchases that you've made and the price drops, it automatically negotiates a discount for us. Mm -hmm. The point, I'd, I mean, interesting point I'd make uh, for startups working with Capital One is sometimes at Capital One, the pressure for monetization is not as much because of an existing mm -hmm. consumer base that a, that a startup might uh, face. So in, in the example of Paribus where they were taking a cut of the discounts that they were getting back for the customers with Capital One offering with our credit, for our credit card customers, that pressure isn't there for us. Um, on the topic of how do you work better with uh, with a large financial enterprise, I think data privacy and security is of uh, paramount importance for us. So uh, the, the more um, troublesome part is the upfront making sure the right controls are in place and the right processes are in place. Um, Capital One, I think I've been fortunate enough uh, to have worked with a number of startups um, in my day job where as, so, as soon as we can cross the initial privacy um, handling processes piece, mm -hmm. things move really, really quickly. Because uh, as a bank, I think the number one thing we have is our customer's trust. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Right. So if, if the customers can't trust us, then we have no business <laughs> being a bank, right? So that's that's the one main thing that I would point out. And Sean, um, dealing with inv on the investing side rather than on the, the banking side, how have you found it different sort of selling into hedge fund as opposed to maybe a prop trading arm of a bank uh, in, in terms of getting their data, giving data? Uh, what, are some, what are some things you've found in the sales cycle that have really held you up and some things that have sort of allowed you to accelerate? So it's interesting you bring that up. Um, the way we work with hedge funds or wealth management companies is very straightforward, right? You can, they can plug in our AI and they can choose to like optimize their existing investment stack and we just end up charging um, a performance fee which is typically um, like a certain percentage of the alpha that is generated by the AI above, their, above whatever benchmark they have set internally, right? Now, typically in, in some cases, like if you have like a hedge fund that already does quantitative investing, they sort of have some team already or that's, that's trying to do something similar, right? So you can come in, we can just augment them. They probably have their own internal risk benchmarks around it. They can plug in those benchmarks to our AI and it's more or less the same. So the so in our case, the sales the sales stack, if you will, it kind of remains the same, which is like we take just like a, 30, a, a, a certain performance fee um, about off the alpha that is generated above the benchmark. Um, the other bit that we do is because because our AI is explainable, especially in context of financial markets and the really quantitative investment strategies don't have that layer of interpretability and all of that, um, we also have received a lot of like um, inbound requests from all data providers, right? So typically you'll find that all data providers that are selling into these hedge funds, or into these you know, uh, wealth managers, and you know, even someone into like someone like Capital One, right? Um, they want to be able to make their, their own sales cycle better by bringing in a layer of interpretability to their products. Right. So effectively, they end up becoming our kind of like, um, almost like a sub-customer, right? Yeah. Um, and then that conversation is obviously a little different and it's structured more around like um, pricing and you know what kind of data is being explained and so on and so forth. So, so that interpretability is obviously a huge issue in FinTech because if the SEC comes in, you've got to be able to answer their questions. Um, but practically, like for a startup, uh, working especially with neural mo based models or whatever else, it's it's very hard to understand sort of how far you should go in making your models decomposable and interpretable and documenting every part of that. Um, Ashish, maybe you could speak to this or maybe Sankita, I'm not sure. Uh, what practices have you put in place so that while a model is being developed, whether it's in the model selection phase or whether it's in the training phase or whatever, what practices do you actually put in place to make sure that the end result is interpretable? Because once you've put all the ingredients in the blender, you can't like uncrack the egg, so to speak. Um, but how do you make sure from the beginning you know what's going in? It is, a, it is a challenge, especially for deep learning models. There's a couple of structural things that we have uh, put in place at Capital One. Mm -hmm. We have a, a team called the Model Risk Office. Uh, which has broad purview about across all models that are developed at Capital One, and they also own the regulatory relationship. So, uh, being in a very regulated space, uh, there are certain types of models. For example, credit models or fraud models, or less fraud but more credit models, that um, we need to explain that they are fair, uh, that they are not biased in, in any way, yeah. that they are explainable. Uh, decisions have to be clear, and I think we owe it to our customers also that there is a line of sight into how a certain decision, whether to increase your credit line or to give you a credit card or a loan, was actually made. Um, so this model risk office, I think uh, some of our work has been to push um, the regulators to adopt more complicated models it itself. Because uh, by and large, um, it might sound funny, but a large variety of our models are linear models just because of the regulatory challenges, not because you can't use a, more, a better model. So influencing some of the regulatory environments and working with them to, to explain these models, so using boosted models or trees and mm -hmm. things like that, ensembles work, work better. And the second part is, um, looking at new ways of testing the outputs of a model. And in some cases, uh, being creative with what data do you frame it? Because if you treat a black box and say, okay, these are the various cases that I plug in and these are the outputs, that's one way of assuring that the outputs are fair, right? 
So there's a lot of work we do in generating unique sets that try and break the model itself, right? Uh, try to sneak um, a biased outcome from it. Yeah. Uh, learning a little bit from some of the work that's been done in the uh, GAN world, in the generative adversarial world, trying to use that kind of approach internally to see are there hidden blind spots that like we don't know about after we've trained the model. Um, as we were talking earlier, the model also learns the bias <laughs> yeah. um, because the, if the bias is in the inherent data used to train it. So there's a couple of things that we do there. Um, so we have to get to data privacy. Um, and I think we should, I think what would be cool to hear is how has how have customer attitudes towards data privacy changed? Mm -hmm. um, and Xavier, perhaps we can start with you because you know, your customers on one side are managers of funds, like people like me, and you, you have them submit performance data and whatever else, and in return, you connect them to significant sources of capital. Um, what are their concerns and what are some typical, like the, the top one or two data privacy issues that come up for them? Um, so in our case, it's interesting because we already have two types of customers. Yeah. Um, the first type of customers would come back to us and say, hey, you know what, I'm okay to give you data as long as I get something back in return. And the privacy there, they're like, you know, they're okay to share even with like some of their peers um, some of that information as long as, again, you know, like we give something back in return. Um, and this may sound strange in light of like some of the recent events, but you know, but on the other side, you know, if you're talking with like you know a larger VC firm, or you know, you have somebody who has like you know a portfolio that is doing very well and doesn't want to share some of those contacts, like the onus obviously is on us to make sure that this information is kept securely. Um, but the part that is very interesting there is really like you know, what do you do like you know to protect that information? Because when you start building modeling on top of private information. You know, you have to protect the input, but you have to protect the output, but as well the model by itself and all the different layers in between that you're building. Um, and those are some of the debug tools that probably are still like, you know, being developed that are very, very difficult, right? Like, when do you reach out and find out that somebody messed with your model? Yeah. Uh, Singhita, you have the opportunity to talk to, I mean, some of the biggest companies in the world, in the world and how have their attitudes changed over the last six to 12 months? And, you know, have you practically had to incorporate different elements to your sales process or products to respond to those privacy concerns? So we work with the federal government agencies. Obviously, data is extremely difficult for them. I mean, privacy is not something that they're willing to budge on. We have seen uh, healthcare companies still very, very concerned about making sure HIPAA is followed. So I wouldn't say that a lot has shifted. Mm -hmm. The main shift that we have seen, though, is the adoption of cloud has begun to take on uh, some, some root within the banking customers, and that's allowed us to get a few problems that the data is they're feeding. They can, they can actually put the data in the cloud. Um, in terms of privacy regulations for GDPR, we have to be very careful to ensure that we can provide them interpretability of the model results. And to your question earlier, uh, the way we did that is that our software inherently has that property in our methodology. So it starts with the understanding that it has to provide explainability along the way. And so that's that's what we do at the heart of our software. So I'll just finish on um, on a question about what you would be doing if you weren't doing um, what you're doing in fintech today. As in, there's so many opportunities to use machine learning in fintech, whether it's to revamp insurance or consumer applications or lending or wealth management or even just ancillary CFO services, um, expense management, whatever else. There's there's a lot of cool stuff out there and a lot of cool opportunities. Obviously in FinTech it's a huge challenge to get the data in the first place, but what would you be working on if you weren't working on your current company? Any cool ideas that you've seen recently that have really piqued your interest? Go, yeah. Maybe next, okay, so um, if I wasn't doing what I'm doing, and I'm, I love what I'm doing, so I We all love what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> so, just to be clear, um, I'm seeing this interesting prospect that really is an idea that is from, um, from a blog that our founder wrote, which is, uh, as he is on the board of a lot of technical uh, boards of these large banks, right, HSBC, Citibank, and so on, the, the concept of using data not as sort of a byproduct of what we do, but to treat data as a product and have product managers that manage your data from beginning to end, like the life cycle. And you know, companies like Google and Facebook have done that as part of their DNA. 
but it's also business enterprises job I think to begin to think about that because so much more can be driven out of data if you would treat it. Yeah, that's, inter that's an interesting answer because it's a, it's about a function that you would maybe explore being part of in an organization. Mm -hmm. Sean, what have you seen recently that's uh, piqued your interest? I think I would still be working on this even if this was the last second of my life. <laughs> so um, that's a good way to put it. But um, the the other thing, uh, I would use machine learning to like figure out what people's lives are worth and then probably tokenize them. Right. I'm not quite sure what you mean there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can all people's lives. So do you mean people, is this an insurance thing? It's not an insurance thing. It's okay. that you literally tokenize the person using machine learning to figure out what their life is worth. All right. So. All right. Buy income streams. I see what you're saying. Xavier, can you top that? Uh, no, I think it's going to be very boring after that. Uh, I think medicine. I would work in medicine and see how AI can really improve like people's life. I think there's a lot of things that are going to happen there. Ashish, um, you, Capital One sees a heap of startups because they're particularly friendly to them. Um, either some problem that you're trying to solve and you haven't had a startup come in the door that's solving it well enough yet um, that you would suggest people work on or just something that you've seen recently that, that caught your eye? Um, I feel that um, if you look at the global market, not just the US market, access to financial products, mm. access to capital for all levels of society is a, challenging, uh, is a, is a challenge. And AI can actually scale, allow you to scale solutions that otherwise are not possible. If you imagine doing a, running a credit bureau in a country like India or China and pushing a billion people through it, uh, that will probably strain even the best financial bureaus. And then building access for where income is not at the same level or not tracked at the same level where taxation rules are different. Um, I would love to do something there to allow, to bring, I think, extend this concept of fairness beyond just a model being fair, but bringing access to society for financial products. It's a very important part of people's lives. So. I wish we could do something. Yeah, for what it's worth, that's what's most exciting about applying machine learning to FinTech for me, which is that you have so much more data these days to be able to price risks that people just couldn't price before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, the societal effect of that is services weren't provided yeah. to parts of society. Um, so that's maybe a nice way to finish. Um, hopefully you've got one or two uh, tips here today. Um, please thank our panelists for sharing what they learned. trying to solve your financial problems to solving your commute problems. Um, actually, Ash was joking and said, you know, when you get invited to a conference in, the city, in San Francisco, you can't refuse it. I don't have to commute down in the valley. I uh, said, so, well, you know, Silicon Valley, frankly, is becoming bipolar. It's really hard to move people. Like, when they are in the south, they want to stay in the south, and when in the city, they don't want to go anywhere else. So the truth is, we have a mobility problem. Uh, even in the city, I see scooters. I was on my first scooters recently, and on the bicycles, and I kind of love it. At the same time, it's super risky. Uh, externalities left and right. Uh, so I'm very excited about the next panel to tell you a little bit about you know, what they think their vision is about autonomous systems, vehicles, and kind of on-demand mobility. So please welcome our next panel, and then we'll talk more after that about how we bring public and private potentially together to solve some of the challenges that you will hear about on the stage. So please welcome them. Good afternoon, uh, can you hear me okay? Great. Uh, so I'm Evangelos Simoudis. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for being here today. Uh, I've, been, uh, I've been working on uh, data and AI uh, for the past 30 years here in the Valley, um, and both as an entrepreneur, as, a, as an executive, corporate executive, and for the past 20 years as a, as a venture investor. And uh, in addition to uh, what we're going to talk about today, I uh, recently published a book on the, called The Big Data Opportunity in Our Driverless Future. And in, you can read some of my more newer thoughts about uh, transportation and mobility in, on my blog. Uh, my firm, uh, Synapse Partners, um, invests exclusively in early stage companies that develop enterprise applications that combine data 
uh, with uh, data exploitation technology, primarily AI based. And um, we create many of our investment uh, thesis um, by working uh, with a number of corporate partners, large corporations from uh, three industries, uh, including the uh, transportation and automotive industry. Now, next generation mobility is one of our focus uh, investment areas. Uh, initially, we made a number of investments relating to the exploitation of data uh, for uh, the autonomous uh, vehicle. In other words, how to use data to enable autonomy. Uh, companies like uh, Renovo, uh, Metamoto in the simulation space, uh, understand.ai in the uh, labeling space. Uh, following the, the publication uh, of, of my book, we've been, we've been focusing a lot more on investment opportunities relating to data and AI for next generation uh, mobility and the insights that can be created from the exploitation of the data that is particularly generated from, from fleet-based uh, mobility of, of people and, and goods. And we've made a, a number of, uh, of investments in that area uh, with companies like uh, Safecraft, uh, Astound, and, and Paxara. Now, companies uh, are moving uh, from autonomous vehicle demonstration to, to pilot deployments of such vehicles, both for human transportation as well as transportation of, uh, of goods. The, uh, the scope and range of these uh, applications for, and for the pilots will continue to expand from more constrained to more dynamic uh, environments. Uh, for example, uh, campus mobility and movement of, of goods in, in constrained settings uh, will come way before uh, open-ended uh, passenger ride hailing. Now, the pilot use of, of autonomous vehicles for, for ride hailing, ride sharing, and goods delivery will continue to, to grow uh, globally. And early in the next decade, and certainly by 2025, uh, we expect that several companies uh, will be generating revenue by employing um, autonomous vehicles that, that offer such services. Now, the, the transition from human-driven to autonomous vehicles will require companies offering uh, on-demand mobility services to actively manage the autonomous vehicle fleets they, they utilize. Uh, these fleets may be owned by, by these operators, as, as GM uh, appears to be doing right now, and even, and even Waymo, uh, or uh, they will be owned by other companies, much like uh, aircraft today is are leased by the airlines that, that fly them. Now, fleet, fleet operators uh, initially may have no, op no option but, but owning this, this fleet, but eventually we will see new companies that are uh, dealing with various aspects of this uh, new value chain uh, that, is, that is being created. Fleet operators of on-demand mobility services uh, uh, of on-demand mobility services companies must be more than ride coordinators. They must become fully responsible for the customer's overall transportation experience. And we're seeing a little bit of that as, as companies like um, Uber are, are getting into bike sharing. Uh, they must be uh, responsible for the, the, vehicle, the vehicle's operating costs and the overall passenger uh, safety. This will give rise to another set of companies that will be responsible for maintenance, refueling, repair, and other functions that today uh, the, this first generation of ride hailing companies do not have to deal with. Uh, there are several implications um, that are arising from the use of autonomous vehicles in, in fleet-based mobility from uh, uh, service, safety, and price as being, being differentiators. Uh, the, uh, the, the importance of the, the first and last 10 feet, as I call it, in the, in the overall experience being a lot more important than the 10 miles in between. Uh, data and AI uh, will become key differentiators and monetizers for, for on-demand mobility. Uh, regulation and education will become very necessary as we're looking for, um, for the right business models. Uh, we will see new ecosystems with, uh, with new dynamics in terms of partnerships, investments, and acquisitions. 
uh, and a new value chain will, will emerge uh, that is much more similar to what we see today in the airline industry than what we have gotten used to in these early days of, of ride, share, ride sharing, ride hailing, and other, and other mobility services. So we want to explore uh, some of these issues, some of these themes with our two uh, distinguished panelists. So I'll, I'll have John and uh, Nadine, we're very happy to, to have them here tell us a little bit about themselves before we move into the uh, questions. Sure. Hi, I'm John Absmeyer, and I lead the uh, ADOS and Autonomous Driving uh, Program for Samsung. Um, I am a car guy. I spent uh, more than two decades in the automotive industry working on all the technologies that are just now starting to see the light of day. Things like uh, the EV1 the, from Who Killed the Electric Car. Uh, that was one of the first things I worked on. Uh, worked on things like telematics and connectivity and uh, been working on ADOS and autonomous driving for the last 12 years or so. Uh, but really happy to be here, thanks. Hi, Nadeem Sheikh with Lyft. I'm responsible for defining and executing Lyft's roadmap to scale autonomous cars on our network. Um, so been with the company about a year or so. Uh, prior to that, I spent about seven years working kind of the intersection of mobility, technology, and energy. I spent seven years at a company called Opower, which we sold to Oracle a few years ago, where as an executive team and ran a non-US business. Prior to that, I spent about four years in McKinsey, where I led most of our work on autonomous mobility, electric vehicles, and car sharing. Um, prior to that, I worked at Lufthansa and was a diplomat for the German Foreign Service. So I'm very interested in the intersection of technology, communities and then you know basically scaling a lot of this infrastructure we need to accomplish what Evangelos put on the board. Uh, John let me actually uh, start with a with you and a question actually to both of you but let me start with you is what 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 do you think is going to make consumers feel safe and comfortable and I don't want to deal with uh, the, the recent uh, uh, incidents uh, that uh, companies had but I'm, I'm looking at what's going to make them feel comfortable getting to the vehicle consistently if such people can actually pay money for, for that experience. Well, I, I think, uh, firstly, the focus of ADOS and autonomous driving has to be different than what it's been. I think uh, it's been viewed as a gold rush for, uh, for business, right, to create new models and improve costs and eliminate you know, drivers and so on. Um, and re in reality, the, the big benefit and, and the social impact is around safety and um, eliminating, in the future, fatalities. And so if we approach it that way, it starts with the culture of the companies that are participating, it starts with process, and most certainly standards. Uh, and I think, you know, not necessarily regulating, but having standards and certifying to standards, and having that data and information and process uh, be more visible to the public, and of course, educating the public are all things that, uh, that need to happen. I think people, a lot of people don't even know what the safety systems in their cars do today. They don't know how to use them, they don't know why they're there or what they do. Uh, and so, first of all, we have to explain to consumers what it means, which also comes with their responsibility in controlling and operating a you know, multi-thousand pound machine. So uh, a lot of that has to do with education and of course, like I said before, the culture, the process, and the standards. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with what John said. We probably look at autonomy slightly differently than Samsung might, and then as a supplier to the automotive industry, you're also looking at multiple levels of autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, for us, we're really interested in scaling what's called level four autonomous vehicles, so ones that could op operate driverlessly in certain scenarios. So for us, it's, it, it's a little bit more of a technological leap that we need to make, um, but we also understand exactly what we're trying to solve for in terms of the consumer. It's less about preparing them to take control back from the car, and more about getting them comfortable that the car and the network that's operating it is doing so with their safety first and foremost in mind. So for us, it's really about, frankly, the education process is about also exposing people to the technology. Um, you know, we're starting to run pilots across the United States um, where, we're, of course, there are safety drivers and engineers in the car. We're making sure that they're properly trained and have the right tools to make sure that the ride is safe. But we also want to put people in the car and use that is an opportunity to actually educate them about how the technology works, what are the benefits, what are the things that we're still working on, what, how is it going to improve communities. Um, because at the end of the day, what we want is not only to improve safety, which is first and foremost, I completely agree, but also, also giving back people time and giving back people money. Right? That's what we want to get to at Lyft, is to create a, a shared transportation ecosystem where people are being able to give up their personally owned car and share. 
putting money back in their pockets and putting you know, time back in their lives that they can use either at work or with their family. And let, let me uh, follow on this. So um, as, you're, as you're thinking about the various business models, and recently Lyft uh, started or is starting to test subscription-based yeah. uh, models. So how are you thinking about these this models changing and what will autonomy uh, help you do or not do uh, with with this with these business models in order to, to get again the, the consumers in the in the vehicle. So I think you you nailed the first point, which is around affordability. Right? We do believe that if we can offer people convenient subscriptions and a convenient service, we can give them actually increased mobility to transportation as a service versus the personally owned vehicle they have today, reduce the cost and reduce the actual amount of time that they waste commuting. So that's first and foremost what we believe autonomy will allow us to provide. I also think that it's gonna allow us to change both how effectively we're able to create shared transportation experiences. So there's a lot of flexibility we have now in terms of the form factor of the car. And I know that you know, John's team is working on some of these concepts today that allow us to actually put more people in the same vehicle. Um, we're actually reducing congestion. So that's another goal of Lyft, uh, reducing congestion on the road. I think the third thing is, we're going to be able to serve more communities cost effectively. So I think about my mom and dad, they live in kind of rural Wisconsin. Um, my dad's 80 years old. He doesn't really feel comfortable driving and it's hard for me to watch that they're actually like not seeing their friends as much and kind of withdrawing from the community because they can't get around. And I believe that you know, right now it's not cost effective for Lyft to kind of include them in the coverage map, but I think with autonomy it will be possible. And does this mean, I'm sorry to interrupt you, yeah, does this mean then that uh, because of autonomy you will be testing even business models that, that you're not able to test today because you're, you're using other people's vehicles? So for example, um, advertising driven models or, or something something else where you will be there will be some exchange in order to, to have that lower price and, and that affordability. I think there's one aspect which is there are some degrees of freedom that we might have in the future, in part enabled by autonomy, in part enabled by the fact that the car might look different, that might unlock more creativity for us. Um, I probably shouldn't go into too much specifics there. But also the fundamental cost structure of the car is going to change right, in terms of operating a, a shared electric um, autonomous car once it's scaled up. And I think as that cost structure goes down, the amount of people that we can affordably serve goes up. John, uh, I wanted to ask you about kind of like a, a two-part question We're in an AI conference. So the, 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 first, the first part is, um, in the large, what are technologies that or technological problems that still need to be cracked as we are looking in this mm -hmm. um, uh, fleet-based autonomous uh, mobility? Um, and, and the second part, since we are at an AI conference, which of these are AI uh, dependent? Sure. Which are problems where AI can make a big dent? I was gonna, there's a lot. There's still a lot of challenges, but for sure. But if I focus in on three for the purpose of this conference, it would be compute, sensors, and of course AI and algorithms. Um, I think in terms of compute, the amount required uh, and the power consumption that today's compute solutions offer or processor solutions uh, are not scalable and, and not realistic to put in a, a, an embedded device, not realistic to put in a car that has to generate electricity or that has to draw from a battery to, to, to power those things. Um, so we have to get more efficient, much, much higher power processing capability, and I think that's coming. I think there'll be a step change in the next one to two years. Um, in, in that space. Um, secondly, sensors. Um, today, the sensors that we have are still not even as good as a human. Uh, you know, a human roughly takes uh, somewhere between one and a half and two seconds from the time you perceive something to the time the car actually takes action. So it's like a quarter of a second to a half a second for you to detect it. It's a, a quarter of a second to three quarters of a second to, for you to actually react. And then it's the car, another half a second or so for you know the fluid from the brake pedal to push to the caliper and squeeze the, the, the brake disc. Um, so you know if, if, if we can improve the speed and efficiency of processing, if we can bring in more rich and more uh, higher resolution and higher speed sensor data, then we can train algorithms with better data that uh, will be able to react better. So um, the second part of your question on the AI and the algorithms part, um, most of the fo focus over the past several years has been on uh, detection and classification 
Um, and it's not solved, I wouldn't say, because sensors are still not good enough, but as we get better cameras and as we get higher resolution um, sensors that actually uh, interrogate the environment, things like uh, imaging radar and uh, LIDAR and so on, um, we'll be able to, uh, to get better data faster and, and get more data that we can train the algorithms with and create more efficient algorithms. Uh, the, the problems of uh, detection and classification are coming along. Uh, but the other areas that are definitely need to have a lot more focus are, are on characterization. In other words, um, you know, characterizing the other uh, agents in the environment and not treating them as obstacles. Today's autonomous cars and the, the systems are really just, they see a person or they see another car and it's either stop or, you know, don't. But, uh, but basically they need to characterize those agents and then actually predict the intention of those agents. So, in other words, if, if you treat it as an obstacle, it's, it, you don't, you're not thinking about what it's going to do next. If it's a little kid on a, on a curb with a skateboard, it obviously has much, much different uh, uh, intentions than somebody sitting on the ground with their back against the wall next to the curb. So, how do, how do we make those judgments and then act on them? So, then the, the decision part uh, still is, is largely unresolved and actually, uh, you know, having dynamic planning of, of what to do based on what we predict those uh, agents are going to do. Um, we talk a lot about data, so and I, think I wanted to, to ask you what type of, um, what kind of partnerships, what kind of ecosystems do you see being created uh, as a result of, of the increased um, amount of data and types of data that, that we will see? I mean, you guys capture data from based on these rides and obviously the profiles of, of your users but now you have a lot more capability in these vehicles that are autonomous that you can control the uh, the inside of the the experience the overall experience so talk a little bit about that so I mean, at the highest level i think there are new partnerships we need to forge to be able to effectively offload data off the car so you're thinking about how do we best take advantage of 5g how do we just, you know, build partnerships with companies that can help us decide what data actually should come off the car um, versus on, and what time frame, right? So that's, I think, one problem that we're wrestling with at the moment, which I think the whole industry is frankly wrestling with. You know, pulling hard drives every five hours is not a scalable solution uh, for autonomy. You know, the second is really around storage, um, and you're correct, right? We are gathering a lot of data as part of the operation of our network today but you're probably talking about two, three, four orders of magnitude increase the amount of data that we will have to store and gather, at least during the initial stages of scaling autonomy. And the question is, again, who's best positioned to help industry do that? I think there's going to be some interesting partnerships there. I think the last thing, which actually might come back to the discussion we had around safety, is once we've analyzed data, and we've identified, let's say, a unique set of scenarios that we observed while we were driving our cars, whether they're autonomous cars or cars that have drivers on the road, how can we share that effectively with other players in industry so together we have more scenarios to do more training, to do more simulation, to be more effective at, for, for example, you know, guessing the intention of different people who are walking down the street. Um, and I think that's something that industry is best positioned to solve together. And, and do you find, before I get John, do, do you find the, the relevant participants be willing to, to partner and, and to share, or is there, education that needs to be done on that front as well. I think there's still some education. I also think that this is a really early stage industry, right? And um, I think different players in the industry are still figuring out what their competitive advantage is, the places they want to play. I think a lot of players are, are trying to play in a number of areas and we may see people start to focus a little bit. Um, and I think as people more understand what they're good at, and what they want to do and the role they want to play, it becomes easier to partner with others. Yeah. And so I think we're going to see that as we roll forward through the next couple of years. John, your point? Yeah, I, I completely agree with Nadeem. I, um, not to advertise, but to put in a slight plug, uh, that's the approach Samsung's taking. I think Lyft is taking the same approach. Is it, it, I do not believe that one company can do this all. Uh, and, and they might be able to do you know a few things very well, maybe one thing very well, uh, but no, not one company can do everything very well. So the approach that we're taking, which we announced at CES, is called Driveline. And uh, basically, it's to put together an ecosystem of partners that's, that uh, brings best in class to solve these hard problems. And, and I think, um, you know, at the outset, a lot of companies are all jockeying and trying to figure out where they fit in, as Nadim said, and what their value is and where their core, um, you know, IP and uh, business creation lies. 
Uh, but as that becomes more clear and as partnerships start to form, I think uh, it, it's obvious that uh, companies have to work together to make this a reality. Otherwise, it, it's not going to work. And what kind of timeline are you thinking about here? Well, so for partnerships or for, for business to actually come to fruition? Well, I, I would say initially for partnerships, but for meaningful partnerships, not bargaining ones. Yes, yeah, sure. So for meaningful partnerships, I think there's, of course, technology, innovation, and creation. And those are, I think, already bearing fruit for a lot of companies. Um, and, and that's bringing in you know, partners that have some core piece of, of technology or, or understanding or innovative approach to, to solve problems. Um, and I think those those relationships and partnerships are already are bearing fruit. Um, but then there's the other end of the spectrum when it comes to market. And I think that what we're, we're starting to see uh, now, uh, level three, and I know Lyft is focused more on level four and, and up, but um, trying to use the technology for even safety applications like level two and level three, they're, they're bearing business fruit today, but on a very small scale. Penetration is still less than 10% of the car fleet. Um. I think last last question actually I was asking both of you is with with fleet based um, uh, mobility on demand mobility um, the the role of cities is starting to change and and maybe even the the role of public transportation uh, certain types of public transportation as we know it today uh, how are you guys thinking about it how are you yeah, thinking? yeah yeah actually I want to start with you yeah so from our point of view if we cannot make autonomy and the introduction of autonomous technology into the left also simultaneously make public transit stronger in America, we have not succeeded. Um, so we are very focused as a company on trying to make sure that we are supporting public transit. So in San Francisco today, for example, 25% of all left rides begin or end at a public transit um, connection point. So we know that people are already using Lyft, and I'm sure Uber as well, to get to and from public transit. I believe that, especially things like rail, we can be very effective at driving even more passenger to, um, to rail lines because we can make it very easy to get to the station and get, to get back. But right now, I think that a lot of people might actually get rid of a car because they can take a lift or a lift line to the Caltrain station and get down to their job and they're actually getting off the freeway. Um, so that's really important to us. I think the second thing that's really important to us is that if we do have people that choose to not use public transit and instead want to use Lyft, that we're making sure that those rides are shared. Um, so you know, roughly 50% of our rides here in San Francisco are shared rides in terms of total trip volume. We would love to get that much, much higher. You know, it's good for our business, it's good for the environment, it's good for congestion, it's good for cities. Um, so those are some of the areas where I feel like we can support public transit. We want to make sure that it's really easy for consumers. And we certainly do not want to replace it. Uh, just one quick thing to add. I, I think it has to be a mixed model, which I think was, Nadim was referring to. I think, you know, there's 250 million light vehicles on the roads out there, and, and most of them are individually owned. While over time those will go away, it's not going to be an overnight thing. It's not going to be a step function change. So we have to make sure that um, you know, municipalities and cities and so on uh, think about how to create a more efficient and optimized mobility solution. It's not you know one company or one city. It's all of it as a holistic approach, and so I, so I think that um, you know that that's got to be the way we, we think about it. And do you do you see that changing um, from geography to geography? I mean, are you guys Absolutely. thinking about it differently, say in Europe versus Asia versus? It is America? different. Yeah. It is different. I, I don't think it's a one size fits all approach. Um, uh, we're not thinking about the end service uh, necessarily, except for trying to create and, and plan for the technologies that uh, we provide to the industry and companies like Lyft and so on. Uh, but, uh, but but that's that's the the, the best way I think uh, that we can solve it globally is look at um, for the particular use case. Yeah, I give the same thing. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and uh, please help me uh, thank them for their. I think those guys made it really easy for me because the next panel is about something that you may not hear about that often, but the importance of bringing public and private partnerships together. And all the issues they brought up, it's all about data and understanding of the impact and intentions of people. And the problem is that as good as Lyft is, as good as Samsung is, they are looking at their own data and they are not getting all the other data. And I think cities, as you've heard, have to play a role and, and the people around the cities that can empower them to look at all that data 
uh, in an holistic fashion uh, can only be brought through a different kind of structure. And so I think it's my pleasure to invite on stage the next panel, uh, which is also an all-women panel, as it, as it happens, which is great. <laughs> but, uh, but please welcome them. I'm talking about the <laughs> well, I'm going to be part of the family. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jane McFarlane. Um, I want to introduce myself first by saying I got my PhD in AI in 1989, so I'm, I'm, uh, you know, dating myself. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I watched us go through the AI winter. And, um, and I'm very excited that we're back into the AI resurgence, um, fueled by the computational power that we have and the data, and the unprecedented data that we have that is you know, fueling this ex exciting uh, technology. And the pace of technology is really staggering at this point and very difficult to keep up on. My current focus is in transportation, which uh, I wish I'd had a chance to listen to the panel before. Um, transportation is a critical infrastructure that's kind of gone unloved by technology for a long time and it's getting disrupted right now by the Ubers and Lyfts and the apps that you actually have on your phone. It's a complex system of systems, it's non-linear and it's transforming right now. So um, how many of you today consulted your app before you came to this location? to find out where you were, where going, the route, the mode, all of us do now, right? And if you think about who is actually controlling traffic out there, it's those apps. And the governments are just kind of pulling on those ramp meters best they can, but it's really the routing algorithms that are directing all this traffic. And they have all the data that's telling us where everybody is. So it's a very interesting kind of dichotomy here um, it's important to understand that it's a critical infrastructure and it impacts every single one of you in this room. It impacts your business from the logistics perspective, employee productivity, employee retention in urban environments, your quality of life if you're sitting an hour commute home in the congested arterials that we experience now. It's a very important part of our ecosystem as human beings and society. So um, to, uh, it is my thesis that to resolve this transformation to a place that is good for all, that we're going to have to have public-private partnerships where we share data across from private industry into a neutral place that we can commingle data, share data, and, and not destroy business models and get it to government and, and public so that we can make good choices about our cities and make them places that we all want to live in. Um, <clears throat> which brings us to the topic of this panel. It's about policy. Um, this past month has been difficult for the tech community. Um, we've had two fatalities due to <coughs> autonomous vehicles. Um, deeply saddened by that. Um, not to equate the two, we've also had two days of congressional hearings around the Facebook situation. So um, we have regulation coming, there's no question. So um, we have assembled this amazing panel here to discuss the challenges of AI deployments and their inherent limitations because every technology has an edge and a lot of these autonomous vehicle situations are created by edge of technology. And then how do we um, help policymakers learn about this very complex environment and this complex ecosystem that we're building? How do we educate them and stay abreast? It's hard for us as technologists even to stay abreast of all this technology that's changing so quickly. How are they to understand this technology so that they can make informed decisions for the public good. So um, I'd like to thank you um, for coming today and I'll let you introduce yourself and uh, give a little uh, bit about your experience with AI and then I'll have some couple of questions. The questions will focus again on those two things. First, the challenges 
of the edges of technology of AI, the inherent limitations, and then what do we do about how we deploy them and where we deploy them. Super, thank you very much. So I'm Kate Verf Butterfield and I am Head of Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning at the World Economic Forum. Um, some of you may know that we opened a center here in San Francisco just last year to focus on emerging technologies. So as well as um, AI, we have autonomous vehicles, drones, precision medicine, cross-border data flows, um, uh, for IR for the Earth, um, and others. <laughs> um, and so, um, thinking about my AI experience, um, it, by background, I'm actually an English lawyer. I'm the wig and gown type of trial lawyer. <laughs> and um, I am also vice chair of the IEEE Global Initiative on ethics of autonomous and intelligent systems. So that's a sort of agile governance mechanism. And I spend most of my days thinking about agile ways of governing the technology. So ways in which we can encourage innovation, but also make sure that the worst doesn't happen. Um, I uh, ran an ethics advisory panel for an AI company, and I have taught law at the University of Texas around uh, policy and emerging tech. Um, I have master's degrees uh, where I looked at AI in terms of law and in terms of inter international relations. But what I do day to day is exactly this public-private partnerships. So I work with governments to create models for governance for the benefit of humanity. And just very quickly, an example of that. We're working with one government, um, not the US government, uh, a government in Europe, to create best practices against which they will judge all um, purchases of artificial intelligence for their government. Now think about what that means. That means that we are effectively drawing the line in the sand and saying the government isn't actually going to regulate, it's going to show you, the people who are creating the AI, what is expected of you within this jurisdiction. And anything that we do at the forum like that is Creative Commons, so it's, it's designed to be a model for other countries to pick up and use around the world. With another country, um, we're reimagining what the regulator will be. So a regulator that actually helps people, who are businesses, and there to, to create their artificial intelligence products and then gives them a seal of approval, certification. So a regulator that helps rather than one that comes in and says, you did it wrong, and we're going to fine you. Norma. Thank you. My name is Norma Cram. I'm the co-chair for the cybersecurity and privacy team at a law firm called Holland and Knight, which is a global firm. But before that, I really spent a lot of my time in the government as a regulator, looking at emerging trends, what the role of technology means, and that balance of what is what really is the definition of a good stewardship, whether as the government regulator uh, in the EU and around the world, banking, financial services, the healthcare system, transportation, energy, uh, water, communications, and we use the term smart cities. I, I think we need to pause and make sure that we are clear what the outcome is that we're looking for. And I'm not sure that I want uh, to trust our lifeline sectors uh, to something to complete control using AI or others, unless I'm aware and we're all aware as to what the risks are and what are the benefits. Now, I think it's perfectly fine, and we were talking about this earlier, if there's an AI system that wants to guide my choices to movies, you know, to things that make my life better, better, smarter, faster, more efficient. But when we talk about uh, full integration of AI or machine learning and, again, the lifeline sectors, I think that there are inherent risks in there. <laughs> I think at the end of the day, we're talking about creating systems that will have a greater cognitive ability than we will. And at the end of the day, we are currently the 
in control of our universe. And I don't, um, I believe that the techno technological innovation is hugely important, but I think the rush for integration into everything is something people need to pause and have a longer discussion about. So, uh, what I think is, you know, these things are coming, right? So, um, more and more advances will be made and um, these systems will be in place where they're making uh, uh, intelligent choices. Um, so what we should be enabling in these systems to make sure that they comply with our expectations for ha around how autonomous systems should behave uh, is to incorporate um, higher level knowledge in them, right? So, so we started out doing these things by incorporating you know, um, axioms and theorems about the world and reasoning about them and then we moved to the completely data-driven approach and we moved away from having a model of the world. Um, and in other fields, uh, you know, we, um, uh, we, we do that much more, right? So in engineering, there's always a model of the vehicle or something like that that you have that you're using then to build your feedback control or whatever it is. And what that allows you to do is to know when you are in a space where you are in control, where you have a view of what the world would be like and when you're not. And so if you're doing these based just on data, then there is always going to be scenarios where it learns the things because the data is biased or it, the data is sparse, it doesn't learn the right things. Um, and, and so I, I think we just need to make sure that as we are building these things, we're building them um, in ways that we are able to incorporate our knowledge and constraints of the world much more easily. And then they can do things like, oh, well, well you know, um, uh, am I in a state where I understand how to take care of it? Uh, much more than um, uh, than now, right? So the the the, uh, the attacks, the adversarial attacks on a neural nets, where it's changing by a couple of pixels, you can change completely what the thing stands for. Those then become much less likely because you have a generated model of the world. Exactly, exactly. Um, and it's it's interesting in transportation, right? If you go to a, a transportation center in a big city. You'll walk in there, it's a big place, it's got cameras everywhere, it's got phones, it's got CB radios, it's got everything. And then everybody who works there is standing over there having coffee. Because they don't know what to do if things go to hell in a handbasket, right? They're, they're, they're watching it, they're communicating, but there are no control systems to really make change if you have huge incidences. So it's a very complex system of systems, and I think when we start putting AI into transportation, we have to be extremely careful that we have this model. Models of urban scale are pretty hard to, to put together. And the other thing is, right, in a lot of cases, you know, we, we heard uh, earlier, I think it was MII talking about, right, building this kind of explainability for financial transactions and things like that. Um, that's where maybe policy can help also, because there are a number of things where the system is not totally autonomous, uh, and it could be made much more explainable, but because of proprietary issues and other things, the models are kept very opaque, and so you don't know why they're making the choices they're making, right. um, and, and um, where it's technically feasible, policy can help enable that. Right. Um, I, th I mean, I think you see that with the GDPR, mm -hmm. where Europe has said we our values are that we have privacy. And, and enact legislation to, to um, underpin that, uh, together with the explainability piece for algorithms. I just want to add to that, that the interesting piece about GDPR is, is focused on the core issue of privacy as a human right and building systems around that. I'm not 100% positive as we think about the integration of AI and just technology in a lot of these sectors that at least in the US that we are building systems at the front end that are creating structures that will allow the individual to own their own data and to manage that data. When we think about autonomous vehicles and sensors, the, the, the future of how companies will be making money right now is about data and individuals' data. And I think there's a juxtaposition that we need to very quickly address on how is this really going to work? Because at the end of the day, the Europeans are very serious about fines and GDPR, and they will absolutely enjoy picking out the U.S. companies to, <laughs> to, I mean, and they've been very clear about that. But I think we need to decide in the U.S. what are we going to do and how are we going to manage those structures? And I'll just say this on the, depending on the, the sector, 
that human machine interaction between autonomous vehicles or autonomous ships or other things, those are really important. And making sure that there's robust cybersecurity protections in those systems is critical. Great. Um, let's move on a little bit to the regulatory side now. I read an article this morning about the, the, the hearings, and I want, they, they gave a summary of the hearings from the past two days. So regulation is coming. Not clear that they know what regulation would even look like. GDPR is good. <laughs> Monopolies were brought up. Don't really know what Facebook does. <laughs> Not clear who has the data now that it's been out in the open. And that AI will solve all of Facebook's problems. So that was the summary of the past two days. So I guess the question is, what do we do about this? Um, obviously, it's very it's unfair to ask the senators in the House to be a, totally understand how artificial intelligence works and um, where it should be placed. And, and what do we do about this going forward? How do we manage this process? Because the technology is moving very quickly. So that, that's why at the forum we talk about agile governance and we say that governance measures are not necessarily going to be the, oh, the traditional measures of legislation and perhaps case <coughs> law where you, you duke it out until you come, come across an answer at a higher level court. And so things like standards, certification, public-private public partnership, thinking about protocols where we put everybody in the room who's interested and come up with um, protocols that they can work with. Um, and I guess two more things that I want to say. You know, we're talking about America, but uh, the rest of the world uh, also we need to be very careful about how we deal with the rest of the world because otherwise, and certainly the developing countries will fall further behind as, as AI grows in the Western or in the developed countries. Um, and I think it, it also, the fact that AI will solve everything comes back to my, everybody brought, was brought up on too many Harry Potter novels <laughs> and we need to get away because it's really dangerous to think that AI is going to solve all the problems that we cause for ourselves. I'll say this, that what I'm seeing certainly in the US and around the world is that the, those regulators are simply saying, whether it's AI or any form of technology, that some portion of the existing regulations that are in place are scalable and flexible enough to accommodate what we're talking about. Certainly in other sectors like transportation, that is entirely not the case. But I think regulators are saying if, if, if regulations are done well, well, um, they are outcome based, they are process based, and safety is still safety whether it's an autonomous vehicle or not. At the end of the day, the private sector needs to educate the regulators on what the technology is and how it works. And I will say to you, as working with the private sector, if you know that there is risk, then you need to own it. And having a more honest conversation with the regulator about how to do it in a way that you are protected legally is important because you have to build some trust with the regulator because at the end of the day, if they think that you're not telling them the truth or not owning, they will just push draconian things down the line and that's really not what we, what we want to see. Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, there is a middle uh, step to you know government regulation and free for all. You know we've done this in the past in many things, which is uh, professional societies that you know uh, help you self-regulate, come up with norms and things that you adhere to. Right? So I uh, IEEE has done this for a number of things. Uh, is doing that now for energy. Right? Both on the government side, advocacy of, of things on, on internally around setting st standards and bringing uh, people together so that they can come together and uh, agree on some norms. And I think that kind of role for these professional societies and self-regulation is a much better outcome than government regulation or sort of free for all for everybody. Yeah, I mean, um, one of the, I, I was standing in line at an autonomous vehicle um, uh, conference and uh, I, I said, I don't think this is going to be out on the roads in mass for decades. And the person behind me said, oh, why, you know, it's just software. <laughs> I said, you know, the, F, uh, the FDA and NASA has been trying to qualify software for decades, and we can't 
we're getting better with test-driven development and DevOps and things like that on, on keeping some kind of control over our software, but um, you know, we don't know how to do that. So um, let, uh, let's set our expectations in the right places, and, and I think the self-regulation and also the sharings across companies could help a lot as we go forward in this space. So it looks like uh, we've wrapped up on time, and uh, I want to thank our illustrious panel for being here today, and they're very interesting comments. you heard a, a bit of a different topic today here on stage uh, you know venture capitalists we think about private companies we love for them to grow fast and acquire a massive amount of data at the same time we need to be careful about our investments and understand what's going to impact them um, that's why education and healthcare are you know spaces where people are careful because they know it's highly regulated fintech as well uh, but similarly right autonomous systems are still very emerging in that sense when you talk to mobility or transportation and, and there's no doubt in our mind that you know the regulator is going to be closely looking at what's happening, and we're going to need to find solutions. And in my mind, the worst solution is them coming at it, regulating without understanding it. Um, so that's why we are, you know, actually founding members of Sarah Lab and what Jane is doing. So big fan of that and taking a proactive role into bringing that conversation forward as opposed to be reactive to it. Uh, so now is a break. You have about I can't remember 20 minutes, 25. Don't, don't, don't track my time on that, but um, we made it halfway through the afternoon. We're going to change gear after that. We're going to go into healthcare. We're going into robotics. We're going to get Richard Sachers from Salesforce to give us kind of a later stage of AI. And then we're going to wrap it up, and then we're going to have a, a hopefully a pretty cool happy hour here. So again, thank you so much for being here with us today, and enjoy the break. been 25 minutes, believe it or not. Um, we're approaching the end of the day, but we have actually three exciting sessions left. So i uh, love to get everybody back, take a chair if you want to listen in and stay tuned, as we heard earlier. Uh, we're going to talk about something that touches us all, which is healthcare. Um, as I said earlier, it's a regulated industry. It's one where venture capitalists, uh, you know, Kind of played a role over the years, but I think now and more and more we see technology taking you know a stab at, at accelerating returns on healthcare, and it's impacting us all. Um, so it's actually to me one of the most exciting topics as well of the day, and I'm really excited to bring on stage you know a great panel with two people that spend a lot of time in the AI world and the direct development world and healthcare world, and to tell you more about it. So without any further ado, please welcome our next panelist on AI and healthcare and the potential deep impact it's going to have. Thank you. We good clicker-wise, whoever's, whoever's controlling the slides here? Just so I know. Anybody? Who's my clicker guy? Dan? Tech folks? Hello? Stand by. Okay, stand by. All right. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's looking like something. Cool. We good to rock and roll? Yeah. Everybody? Okay, awesome. Uh, hey, everybody. How's it going? My name is Dan Pagella. I'm up here with Carolina and uh, Kevin today. Um, most of this presentation is actually going to be a fireside chat with us. Uh, but I was told to kind of tee this up with a bit of the market research that we've done in the healthcare space. So I run Tech Emergence, which is kind of a market research firm focused specifically on AI and business applications. Um, what I'm going to run through today is uh, only going to take about eight minutes. So I'm going to go very quickly through challenges and trends, and then I'm going to sit it down and chat it over with these folks here. 
um, the insights I'll bring up are not so much sort of out of my own brilliance. They're from dozens and dozens of conversations with AI executives and researchers at the intersection of healthcare and pharma and, and machine learning. Um, so we're going to go a little bit into what are some of the major challenges with applying AI in this space? What are some of the friction points of kind of bringing artificial intelligence into the healthcare world? Some of the application trends that we see a lot of in terms of new startups coming out in this space. We follow hundreds and hundreds of companies uh, in the AI and healthcare domain. And if we have a little bit of time, we'll talk about kind of getting around the hype in AI. But I'm really most excited to sit down right after I'm done with these slides and hash over some, some conversations uh, with Kevin and Carolina. So without further ado, we'll kind of dive right in. Um, one first point to bring up about AI and healthcare, I think sometimes it's seen as exceptional in this space, but it, it's not, uh, is that most of what's going on here is, is kind of in pilot phase, quite clearly. Um, most people understand that. What, what isn't understood oftentimes is that if there's any given list of 100 AI and healthcare companies, a lot of the time it's taken as, oh, these are, these are 100 AI and healthcare companies. In fact, they're usually not. So we find, doing a lot of homework on individual startups, that maybe one in three companies that says to be doing AI in the healthcare space sort of has the requisite academic or marquee company like Google, Amazon, Facebook background in AI to maybe even do something with the science. There's a lot of people who can write AI in their about page, a lot of MBAs who can try really hard, uh, nothing against MBAs by the way, uh, but you can't do, can't, do, can't do AI if you just have an MBA. So for the most part, there's a lot of companies that don't really have the requisite underpinnings of really doing AI, uh, so there actually looks like there's a lot more legit AI and healthcare companies than there are. Um, underneath that third that potentially has some promise, we find that maybe only a fourth or a third of them have some kind of meaningful traction with a pilot. So they've partnered with a hospital somewhere, they've partnered with a big drug company somewhere, and they have some degree of traction where it seems like they're feeling out something real. So what that boils down to is maybe one in 10 companies that's a AI healthcare company having any degree of legit traction in this space. That's where we are today. Um, maybe two, three years from now that'll be different, but it's important to kind of tee that up. Um, where are we in terms of kind of healthcare adoption when we poll the companies in this space, the people that are trying to sell into this world? Um, numero uno, in terms of sort of where the industry at large is, is the industry seems to be at a point of needing to understand the ROI. So certainly, at least in the States, even more so than overseas and in Europe mostly, where we've done a lot of our other polling, um, uh, folks are sort of understanding the value prop, but really need to see it hit the ground running in order to pull the trigger. Uh, and that seems to be where the broad kind of healthcare industry, whether it's in pharma or in the hospital setting, kind of is right now. Um, in terms of major challenges, kind of no surprise here. We're going to fly through these slides. Um, the black box issue of machine learning is a major gargantuan issue in healthcare. Um, so if, if you have a system that you don't quite understand, but it seems to prompt forth, let's say, the best recommendations for e-commerce products to purchase, um, even if you don't quite get how it arrived at that answer, so long as you're making more money, who actually really cares that much? Um, but when you're diagnosing people with cancer, a lot of people care a lot. Uh, and it's very, very challenging to sort of have a black box machine come up with diagnoses or make important decisions about patients. That involves sort of uh, deep technical issues with machine learning in general. A lot of people are kind of trying to crack that nut, uh, but it's not necessarily an easy one to move beyond. Um, the other major issue that we see in terms of a friction point of adopting machine learning and AI in the healthcare space uh, is sort of complex stakeholder relationships. This is a little bit simpler in the pharma world. Uh, but selling into healthcare broadly a lot of the time involves a lot of stakeholders at once. Um, if, if I'm selling some kind of a marketing software, I sort of have a person who, if they understand the ROI, could buy and I could get a deal closed. Um, in hospitals, we might sell to sort of the upper echelon of the hospital. We might need doctors to apply it, nurses to be trained on it, uh, and patients to benefit from it. And if anybody in that long, ugly chain sort of wants to clamp up and, and isn't all that receptive, it makes it very hard to actually adopt these technologies. This is particularly challenging because a lot of them don't have a lot of great traction. So complex stakeholder relationships, particularly again selling into hospitals, really makes a lot of this tough. And almost everybody selling into that space gripes about exactly the same things. We talked to dozens and dozens of folks there. Um, lastly, we have the chicken and egg problem. Talk about this as kind of a last friction point. I'm sure we might talk about this a little bit with Caroline and Kevin. Um, uh, a need for case studies. So when we ask the people that do the selling, so we talk to AI startups that are selling into hospitals, selling to pharma, we say, what's keeping you from closing more sales? Vastly above and beyond any other responses, damn it, we need more case studies. Over and over and over, it's the same thing. And so we have this issue of not being able to close deals without case studies. Hard to have case studies unless you close deals. 
um, that's, that's not like a two week solvable problem. That This is a pretty tough over time uh, industry thing and I, I don't think there's really a fast way around it. But uh, almost everybody <coughs> selling hard into this domain uh, is running into that as a potential issue and a hiccup. Um, in terms of trends, where do we see companies sort of spawning in this space? There's a lot of companies focusing on a lot of different spaces. There are a lot of exciting sort of domains of healthcare where AI could be applied. We see oodles and oodles in diagnostics. So when we looked at uh, three, four hundred companies in one of our last kind of big uh, research analyses, and we tried to find the folks who are real actually doing AI, um, the folks that are focusing on diagnostics was kind of the biggest subgroup of those that are selling software. We, we think that a lot of this will be somewhat uh, commonplace in time. In other words, let's say two, three years from now, vision analysis of seeing if your skin mole is skin cancer or something like that, or uh, analyzing MRIs or something like this, just purely saying yay or nay on cancerous or not is, is actually going to be kind of uh, a little bit played out and maybe not a strong enough differentiator. But we see a lot of people doing exactly that right now, both in the States and overseas. Uh, I think stronger differentiators are going to be needed. People are going to need to be bringing in uh, personal medical record stuff and genomics data and genetics data and whatnot uh, in order to kind of further differentiate in uh, diagnostics. But needless to say, imagery, diagnostics, that's kind of the biggest, the biggest area of marriage in terms of new companies spawning in this space, at least from our research. Um, and then medical operation software, another kind of interesting domain. This could involve everything from uh, financial collections, patient scheduling, operational efficiencies. Uh, to some degree, this is the same kind of back office software you might see in any other industry, maybe finance or, or elsewise, uh, but there's a lot of folks selling this into the healthcare space as well. Underneath diagnostics, in terms of software, uh, the people selling into, into the healthcare space, we see a lot, a lot of companies focusing here. I'm personally a little bit more bullish about this stuff making traction in the near term. Um, safer to say that there's occasionally, sometimes, less regulatory stuff with, let's say, filling up your calendar than there is with telling somebody if they have cancer or not. Uh, and so uh, we may see sort of adoption happen in this space first, and if the back office is being more efficient with AI, maybe that'll kind of loosen uh, the gears a little bit to, to bring it into other areas of sort of healthcare. Um, so this is kind of lay of the land of where we are. If you guys want to copy the slides of the research that we base this off of, I'm just Dana Tech Emergence. Otherwise, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to pass it along to these folks. We have Carolina Rizza with uh, Just Biotherapeutics, and we have uh, Kevin Hua with uh, Bayer. I'll let you two give a short intro, and then I'll pass some questions back and forth with you all. So let's get going. Okay. Who wants to start? Uh, I'll start, yeah. Okay. Uh, so my name is Carolina Garcia Rizza. I'm the Chief Business Officer of Just Biotherapeutics. And it is, uh, we have an artificial intelligence driving platform where we are able to optimize antibodies or antibodies like molecules, which are the basis for the big molecules biotherapeutics. And uh, we optimize them for uh, stability, developability, and manufacturability. Uh, in that way, we are able to, to reduce resources, which means uh, speed up the process to the market, bring those antibodies faster to the market, as well as uh, with lower cost and um, highest quality possible. So if we think about uh, biotherapeutics, obviously the three things that we want to solve is to bring them as fast as possible to the market so they can cure patients faster with the highest quality, obviously, because at the end of the day, we always have to keep in mind the patient, and also with the lowest cost possible. Um, and that's what we do with Just Biotherapeutics. Kevin? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kevin Hua. I'm a senior manager responsible for AI machine learning development at uh, Digital uh, Health Intelligence Group with Bayer. So Bayer is one of the largest uh, life science company in the world. That's where uh, aspirin was invented uh, 150 years ago. So we are still an innovative company. That's why we have the digital innovation, digital health group. So uh, I was trained as an AI researcher 20 years ago. I've been working in the industry uh, for 20 years and with uh, different uh, industry problems. Uh, and for the last two years, I worked for Bayer. We focus on one issue, that is how to speed up uh, clinical trials. Because uh, clinical trials is a very uh, specific problem. It is costly, it takes a very long time. I always use the analogy between clinical trials and the aircraft I'm manufacturing. Because uh, I used to work on a one of the largest uh, aircraft manufacturing program to try to optimize it. So it's the same thing, it takes a very long time, 
It's very costly. There are a lot of variabilities. And the only difference is that with aircraft manufacturing, after three or five years, you will have a real product. You can sell for 100 million. But in healthcare, even when you start uh, phase one trials, after three, five years, 90% of the trials fail. That means you wasted a lot of money. And even worse, the, it's even harder to predict the uh, variability, the risks, because there are so many sources of a virus. So that's what we are trying to do. We leverage historical clinical trials data. We try to quantify the amount of risk we'll have in each trial, in each phase of the clinical trials so that we can not only use machine learning model to evaluate uh, existing planning scheduling by our domain experts, we can also forecast to tell exactly how each trial will take, how long each trial, each phase will take, how much it's going to cost. So that's the work we are doing. Cool. Um, so yeah, uh, designing drugs harder than designing aircraft parts. <laughs> okay, good, good, good synopsis on that. Um, so we'll get into the first question that I wanted to ask you both. Um, I think a lot of people are, are interested in sort of what's automatable in the AI and healthcare space. And I'm interested, is there anywhere where subject matter experts in either of your spaces are having maybe some or all of what it is that they do on a regular basis kind of done by AI in any way? And, and if so, sort of where's a lot of that traction happening? I think people are curious about that. Yeah, um, so I think that if you look at AI in healthcare, it has lots of potential applications, like you said previously in your really good um, talk before. Um, what we are applying is wherever um, there is the possibility of gather data, good data that has actionability, and we are able to learn from that data, apply machine learning, that's what we are applying, the, the machine learning. And our case is we are gathering data from all the process, from the design, the process, and also the manufacturability. So in the panel before, we, they were talking about production. Um, and the, the person from GE mentioned how the production of biotherapeutics was very important. I can only echo on that. Um, biotherapeutics are living cells, so it's really difficult to manufacture them. Um, we are applying machine learning in a way that we are making the process much more predictable and much more efficient. Um, we are also improving the quality of biotherapeutics because as I mentioned before, by the design of the antibodies, we are able to optimize them. By optimizing them, we are bringing an asset to the clinical trials that is a much higher quality. So we can de risk in that way um, the, the high level of failure that uh, this uh, asset has. So I think that if you look at the whole process of all the way from the discovery of the, of the drugs, the design, the process, the manufacturing at your clinical trials as well. There is lots of places where you can apply AI, but always when you really have a way to gather that data and to learn from that data that is clean and is good quality. Do you see this involving, just to clarify the, on the question, um, is this involved any reskilling or sort of maybe freeing up of human time and some of that monotony, or is this really kind of a new capability where people are sort of adding time to their already busy schedule? So what has this done to sort of the day-to-day -day work of the folks? So in our case, and I think in your case as well from our previous conversation, it's actually freeing up lots of time. So when uh, there were some comments before on how whether AI is the reducing uh, the possibilities of work uh, for us is actually the opposite because it's opened up much more possibilities uh, where really uh, people can focus now on what they are doing their best and all the repetitive, the wet lab uh, that is repetitive um, work is taken um, in silico, so it's getting f a much more uh, faster thanks to the AI. So in our case, for sure, I can tell you, is open up opportunities. Cool. Yeah, in our case, we work very closely with our uh, domain experts. We have the best uh, domain experts in the industry, but we figure out uh, we still have room to improve. 
because the amount of data is huge and we can even uh, justify it that uh, there are many research if you uh, familiar or you work in machine learning industry there is a type of models called the Bayesian model so that's how we combine domain expert knowledge and what uh, model predicts to make a better model just like uh, what uh, we heard in today's uh, opening uh, session so we need to combine domain expert knowledge with machine learning models then we can get a better model than each of so for, for you folks, again, just to, to carry it through on the question I asked Carolina, um, in terms of the day-to-day -day work of your subject matter experts, does this involve maybe them learning a little bit more about how to uh, maybe put their insights into a machine in a way that it's testable, quantifiable in some way, shape, or form? How is it changing maybe the workflow or the skill set required for those existing subject matter experts? Mm -hmm. Apparently, yeah, there will be some uh, change management uh, process going on because uh, that will somehow disrupt the existing way of doing business. So our plan was we have domain experts, first of all, they still continue to do their own daily work and then we use machine learning models to help them to justify their decisions. And if there's a discrepancy, our models can interpret, can explain why there's a discrepancy. So in that so that we can convince what we need to do, which model, which prediction to use in the end. A machine learning manager, not a machine learning employee, I guess, in that way. That's kind of right. Yeah. Um, in, in the interest of time, we'll get into the next question. I think this was actually one that Carolina had passed along in our emails. Um, in terms of the, the perception of AI for your customers, there's folks who sort of do business with you guys. Um, for some people, sort of AI is irrelevant, and, and it's not, nobody's either excited or fearful of it. Maybe other folks, they, they are excited. Maybe they want more conversations, or maybe they're fearful. They're less likely to want to engage. H how are the people who are the end customer here for you folks um, sort of responding to the, the innovations you're trying to push forth in AI? Is there a pro and a con here? How does, how does this sort of work in your experience? For, um, for us, um you have to consider that um, this industry is very regulated, right? Yep. So the FDA has a very big, strong opinion. So we, one of the biggest questions that we get is, well, I mean, if I optimize with you guys, if this is through machine learning, whatever, what about then FDA, right? And actually, I mean, we are working very closely with the FDA. Our, uh, we have a GMP manufacturing facility, phase one, phase two, um, in the company, and uh, we have worked very closely with the FDA. And actually, we have been working in a way that has been very mutual, um, in a way that we are teaching them as well as we are collaborating with them, which is a really good, nice uh, collaboration to have with the FDA. Uh, that said, I think that um, there is all kind of customers, like you say, the ones that are excited because all of a the sudden they can say, well, I'm collaborating with this company that is the leading technology because has AI. And there is others that say, well, um, I'm not sure, so therefore what you say really good, we have to go through cases and studies. Yep. And uh, just to, out of curiosity, to, to touch on that a little bit, uh, you mentioned some folks are a little bit excited about it. Is there, I mean, I imagine not all of them have a firm grasp of AI. Is it just a bit of the kind of pizzazz factor? Like, man, we, we, we kind of, we have this inkling that we want to be on the edge. It'll be cool to be associated. Is that kind of the feeling? Yeah, there are lots of them. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we certainly see that in other, other spaces. Kevin? Yeah, in our case, uh, I think it's a common reaction to everyone. If you don't understand the theory, it tends to be skeptical. And our customers are internal, and we do have some people are more skeptical, some are more open to new technology. So I think that uh, we have the most smart people at Bayer, because uh, if you look at the uh, life science companies, we have the, the highest percentage of PhDs in the whole industry. So if you explain the technology, they can easily understand it. Also, when we build models, we should make it interpretable and we should make it that uh, can be validated so that's uh, the type of uh, measures we take for how to uh, let people uh, accept our technology 
to, to your point, Carolina, you mentioned sort of your current relations with the FDA involves sort of teaching and working with them um, as, as well as kind of obviously they have their role to play with you guys. Yeah. Um, I, I imagine that won't continue forever, but it certainly is the case now, right? There were probably new technologies you guys would know better than I 10 years ago, 15 years ago in this space where similarly the folks on the bleeding edge kind of had to really sort of mingle with the FDA for a while. At some point, maybe we'll push beyond that and they'll sort of know the areas of ML where they have to be real tight and they'll have maybe a general understanding of some of the more common technologies. When do you see that sort of passing through? In other words, when will the FDA maybe have a, a better grasp on this stuff to the point where it's less of kind of having to show them the ropes, uh, for lack of a better I think that they are learning pretty fast, and you mentioned something before on diagnostics, right? I mean, uh, you have seen so many startups coming out with diagnostic deep machine learning and, uh, and liquid biopsy, right? Um, I think that the FDA is really learning pretty fast for what it is. <laughs> uh, and I have to, I have to say that um, I really believe that, as you know, the head of the FDA, Godlieb, is coming from uh, one of the venture, um, the venture firms here in the Valley. So I think that he's also giving a big impulse to, the, to this bureaucratic agency. So I'm really confident that we are living in, an, uh, in a time where Finally, we have put the, the patient in the center, which is where it has to be. And I think that uh, the, the agencies, the governmental agencies, the companies, big pharma, small pharma, I think that everyone is really working together towards this um, solution for the client, for the patient that is really to try to, to have a better health and to try to cure the diseases and hopefully to use machine learning to predict those diseases so it's not a patient anymore, right? So, okay, so it seems like for, for you in working with the FDA, it doesn't seem like an unbreakable brick wall here. No, it seems not like kind of a pre, pre uh, a I'm very visual. positive, yeah. I have to say. Well, I, I forget the way that you worded it. Pr pretty good for what it is or something, yes. which is, I guess, as good as we could hope <laughs> for. Uh, we're, we're just about three minutes, so we'll wrap it up with a last question, maybe some closing insights about advice that you folks might have on applying machine learning in life sciences. Um, lots of, we've done tons of interviews in this space. There's a lot of interesting sort of friction points about kind of getting machine learning to go into this, uh, this computer science expertise to make its way into this life sciences sort of universe. Um, what is some advice that you have for folks in life sciences to, to maybe make that transition easier, bring on the right talent, make those systems work? Um, any, any thoughts? Uh, for me, I will say that um, I was before in a big corporation like Kevin, I was in Roche, and being in a small startup is another world, right? Um, I can say that uh, never underestimate the power of education for your clients, for um, your customers, for the payers. I mean, think about healthcare, that is a really um, a, a different stakeholders, and each one taking their own way, right? Like the, driving their own forces. So education is key, and uh, as you mentioned very well before, um, case studies, always as soon as possible, show to the market that you have positive case studies and explain what have you done through those case studies. What have you achieved and how and why it's important and what's the benefit for the patient. I think I will not emphasize that enough. It's really important, the education, when you are doing some innovative uh, cutting edge technology. Cool, good point. Yep. Yeah, in our case, uh, they are actually from the high level management and we believe in technology and we uh, have started a few new uh, analytics groups we are hiring people and it's just up to us to show them how this technology is going to work how it's going to help us uh, help the company to improve our daily business do you sort of second maybe what carolina has to say about education i've heard a lot that it's important for the life sciences folks to really bleed a lot of that expertise early and often onto the computer science folks and vice versa. Find a, a cadence of sort of shared knowledge there. You guys are, I imagine, working on that quite ardently. In my case, yes. So we have uh, computer science together working with protein expertise, um, all kind of scientists of wood lab. 
So they are working uh, together, and now we are starting to hire people with double measure. So uh, science, biology, and computer science, and we are seeing more and more of those. And actually, that's like a perfect beauty, perfect combination. I, I think it's in closing. We're five seconds here. I think it's 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 up to you guys and companies like y'all to uh, take these computer science folks, embed all these life sciences knowledges, and then have that sort of spread into the, the world because right now the, those two are, are often not connected. So I have my fingers crossed that that works out. Thanks so much, guys. Give it up for, for our great team. Thank you. Thank you. So you heard it, of course, no surprise, in healthcare you need double measures now. You need to study even longer. Um, we like the intersection of deep domain knowledge, expertise, and, and technology. And if you're fortunate enough to find any one person, that's amazing. But often it requires a team. Building a company is, is really a team sport. So uh, let's shift gear a little bit and, and let's talk about robotics. Let's bring on stage amazing people from SoftBanks and Ever. And, and telling you a little bit about where things are going in that world, which is actually really exciting. So, Steve, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. And then I'm going to sit and enjoy the show okay. here with Doug. And then we'll, uh, we're going to fireside chat after that. I think they're going to load your deck. All right, so we just need to get this up here, yeah? Yes. Yeah. All right. So, thank you. Um, my name is Steve Carlin. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer of SoftBank Robotics. And uh, thank you all for having us here, Ben. And thanks to Bootstrap Labs. It's a great event. Um, I'm going to let you in on a little secret, which I think a lot of you already know. Robots in the next 20 years will not be C-3PO. There, I've said it. Most of you know this. Uh, they will, however, be able to move around your world. They'll be able to move around your house, your office. Uh, they'll be able to do a lot of the basic tasks. Probably sweep the floor, maybe clean the table, certainly scrub your bathtub. But what they won't be like is uh, the level of interaction that you see in some of our science fiction movies. It won't be quite like in the movies where the protagonist banters amiably, perhaps sarcastically, with the AI as it goes and gets him a beer or, or cleans up its room. <laughs> Interestingly, the issue is not a hardware issue. It's a software issue, and most of you know that. We have hardware that can go anywhere. We have sensors that can see you. We have microphones that can hear you. But what we don't yet have is the software to create the brain that C-3PO has. Um, that level of uh, sophistication is general artificial intelligence. And as people in this very room will tell you, that's probably about 30 years away. But this form factor, this humanoid design, boy, we, we want it to be intelligent, don't we? Yeah. And if you're me, and you're in the business of humanoid robotics, well, that's both a blessing and a curse. Because on one hand, you want to go engage with this form factor. On the other hand, level setting your expectation of what that humanoid robot can do is a challenge. I think there's an assumption that we make that when we talk about robotics with AI, we are somehow talking about the distant future. And, and the reality is, um, even though that sounds so grandiose and so far-fetched, um, we aren't just entering into the technology revolution. We're actually right in the middle of it. Uh, and the reality is our clients and, and customers are reaping the benefits of that today. So let me explain. The way I want you to think about robotics is as the next computing platform past mobile. Not necessarily replacing it, just building off of it and connecting to it. Many of you know this man, Masayoshi Sun. He is the founder and CEO of SoftBank. And Moss has a grand vision around technology and its future. And robots actually play a very large part of that. What Moss is putting together through his company's acquisitions and his uh, investments is a powerful network of data collection tools. As you know, Moss established the Vision Fund, which has raised close to $100 billion. And for perspective, if you don't know this, that is the largest round of investment capital ever raised. In fact, it is more than the rest of the investment capital out in the world available. MASA has the ambitious goal of bringing together all these technologies to drive the information revolution. In particular, artificial intelligence, which is why we're here. And to make the benefits of that accessible to the world, almost anywhere in the world. And I'm fortunate, being a, a SoftBank company, to be able to connect to 
just about all of these companies, which is actually a great place to be if you're me. So how's Masa and SoftBank gonna do this? Well, there are roughly seven and a half billion people in the world. There's about 21 billion connected devices in the world, everything from cell phones to laptops to refrigerators. And as astounding as that seems, in 30 years, that number is expected to grow 10 to 50x to well north of 200 billion connected devices. By making investments in companies like Arm, NVIDIA, Paytm, OneWeb, Nuado, Slack, Boston Dynamics, Uber, DoorDash, Didi, you name it. I could keep going on, actually. That's what's kind of funny about this. Um, SoftBank and the Vision Fund are uniquely positioned to pro propel and leverage the, this device growth. So let me give you a quick example. I happened to start my career at Procter & Gamble. And I, so I've always been fascinated in um, the retail environment. What I know from my days in working retail are, is that there are many different problems that plague this $20 trillion industry. Labor costs, inventory control, trend and category analytics, one-to-one -one marketing are all critical and they're actually very difficult to get right. So according to Caden uh, Consulting Group, CPG companies around the globe spend $225 billion a year targeting consumers relatively blindly, I might add, to deliver a value proposition for their brands. About a hundred billion of that is spent in signage, a lot like what you see here. Signage which by its very nature is static communication. That is to say, it cannot call you over, it is not dynamic, and actually depending upon some of the creative, it's what I like to call retail camouflage. It's both unremarkable and unnoticeable. But what if you had a, a humanoid robot there? In a retail setting, uh, a robot like Pepper, who hopefully you've met outside, uh, can fundamentally transform what we call the first moment of truth, that point in which you interact with a, a, a product. So this technology has presence. And, it, and utilizing Ever, who you will meet here in a moment, Ever AI's uh, facial recognition software, will be able to interact with specific shoppers and tailor that value proposition to that person, all in a dynamic way, meaning in the ability to call them over and interact with them. And there's a couple of key pieces to this. First, recognizing a person is actually them, as we've talked about through several of these different panels, is called identity. While I worked at Facebook, we prided ourselves on being able to serve ads to specific people across devices as they logged in through them. Uh, fundamentally, though, for the notion of omni-channel marketing to really work, that is to say, delivering a contextually relevant message to the right person at the right moment in time, uh, you have to know who that person actually is, or it doesn't work. As we've seen in the news lately, unfortunately, not everybody who's on Facebook is who they say they are. So putting marketing messages aside, the second most important part of facial recognition is to allow for attribution. Truly identifying the person who's standing there and typing in the commands. And Doug's going to talk a little bit more about this too, I think. Attribution assigns providence, and that's what's key there, both forensically and legally. That's about a $600 plus billion dollar opportunity around the globe. And Google and Facebook and Alibaba are all getting better at it every day. However. What I just said to you is they have a hard time saying that it's 100% you. 99% me is not really me. And every bank and financial institution is wrapping their heads around this. Same with Apple, the same with Samsung, Huawei, Tencent, Baidu, Ant Financial, HSBC, quite literally everybody. A third piece is intent recognition. And that is to say, when you pick up a green shirt in a store, ostensibly you're there to buy that green shirt. That lends itself to a series of potential interactions with that shopper, especially if I know it's you, that is, I have identity. Do you need that in another size? Do you need that in another color? Do you want me to add that to your online shopping basket? When you understand intent, you can deepen that experience and provide a shopper or a search query or a service you provide um, and then move that shopper all the way through that marketing funnel to uh, purchase, to closure. Identity with intent is a very powerful set of tools for retail. 
The final piece of the puzzle then is to understand the context of the environment that you're in. How many of you, by show of hands, have gone to the store with the list and found that the item that was on that list is not in the store? We all have, right? That is a $65 billion problem in the United States, just in the United States. Um, what if we could go one extra step and not only tell you what products that we are recommending to you, but literally tell you where it is, that is what store, and where in the store that product is. With, with our just announced association with Symbi Robotics, that's exactly what SoftBank Robotics is going to do. And add uh, attribution and intent to that. So let me tie this all together for you and we'll, we'll move on to, to the panel. By combining the form factor, that is the hardware, uh, with just a few key AI partners like Ever, uh, we can transform the key revenue driving experience for a $20 trillion industry. But retail is just one of the industry examples. As I said before, I have the benefit of being part of the SoftBank umbrella. Therefore, um, I have potential to connect to platforms and data sets that will define the world's economies going forward. And that's pretty profound if you stop and think about it. So I told you at the onset that uh, we won't quite be C3PO in the next 20 years, and that's still true. But um, what we can connect are the various dots, and that's the growth and explosion of the devices, the data that these devices uh, kick off and the AI that that powers, and then this robotics form factor which allows for better engagement. And so you can see where the next 20 years is gonna go. So admittedly, we have a lot of fun. We're super happy to be part of SoftBank and be able to um, help take the AI revolution into where it's going. Uh, but with that, why don't we get to a more interesting conversation, and I will sit down and give you the clear. Thank you, Steve, thank you. So let me turn it over to, to Doug here. Yeah, I don't need to introduce myself, um, but why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and Ever, and then we'll we jump straight into this conversation. Sure. Uh, so my name is Doug Ailey. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at, uh, at Ever AI. Uh, Ever AI is a face recognition platform uh, that has a, a few things that distinguish it. Uh, one is the, is the data set off of which we were built, which is about 13 billion uh, photos uh, and videos. Um, from a consumer company that we actually started uh, about five years ago, um, and then recently uh, made the face recognition technology that we use as a consumer company available to uh, to enterprises. Uh, the other things that uh, distinguish us are because of that large data set, the um, the accuracy that we're able to provide to our partners, um, as well as uh, some of the ways that we're willing to uh, deploy that technology and work with partners, uh, such as uh, SoftBank, where we're uh, humbled to work with them. Um, we provide a, a very a very low footprint uh, iOS and Android uh, SDKs. Uh, that use our face recognition uh, software uh, and a bunch of different capabilities that come along with that software, um, as well as a, um, uh, an API that you can deploy uh, behind your firewall on your own hardware um, or in a private cloud, uh, as well as in a public cloud if you so choose. Um, so Great. That's us. Awesome. Thank you. Well, I don't know about you, but when you, when you have SoftBank on stage with you and you're listening to the numbers, it's mind blowing. Like, you shift from your thinking of thousands to millions to billions and trillions. Right, and thank you, Steve, for putting that into context because I mean, a lot of the people out there, they hear about the phone, they hear about the investments, but frankly, I don't think people connect the dot. And I think what you really outlined here in front of us today is the incredible platform that really SoftBank is putting together. And it's just mind blowing to see that. And I think, you know, tying the dots and, uh, and thinking about robotics and sensors, really, right? Robots are being sensors at the edge. Um, that's pretty phenomenal. So I turn it over back to Doug and we'll go back to you. Um, well, actually, no. Before I go there, how do you think about building an ecosystem around this robotics, right? Because it sounds to me that there's an opportunity to partner. So what are you thinking there? Where are things going? And then I'm going to ask Doug, how do you achieve the dream of every company and it's going to stay busy the rest of your life working with stuff? <laughs> yeah, I think we, uh, we started out as a, very much an R&D company in Paris over the course of the last 11 or 12 years. SoftBank bought the original company called Aldebaran and turned it into SoftBank Robotics. So thus allowing us the connection to all these companies. You know, I, I think what we recognize is we're a robotics company, meaning we make robots. We don't make facial recognition. We don't make uh, dialogue flow. We don't, we don't necessarily do cloud computing ourselves. So what we've been doing over the last year and a half is really adding to the platform with the likes of Ever, with the likes of dialogue flow, uh, then potentially next intent recognition, et cetera. So, so that we up-level the experience that you can provide with this hardware, because it's a unique form factor. And the form factor really matters in robotics. This, 
This form factor is designed to engage with you. That's all it's meant to do. It's not going to vacuum the rug. It's not going to grab you a beer, though that would be awesome. Um, <laughs> it's going to pour your beer, maybe. It, it, maybe it will pour your beer. The point is, it's designed to engage with you, and so by allowing uh, the, the different software and, and technologies that are represented, some in this room and some on the stage, uh, we actually make that experience better. Yeah, and I think that, that's really the opportunity. And so my question back to you is, what was it like to try to engage such an, a giant company, you know, in some sense, and what was the process like? And then, you know, I think, what does it mean for your company as well? I mean, uh, I'll start with the, the latter uh, piece first. Obviously, it means a lot um, just, to, uh, just to work with SoftBank. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, quite frankly, uh, honor to, uh, to work with them. So, um, and as far as the working relationship goes, uh, it's been phenomenal. Um, uh, it's much more agile. I mean, the nice thing about SoftBank Robotics is that it is a, um, it's a, is a standalone company. And, uh, and working with the team here in, in France and Japan, um, incredibly agile company. So, um, you know, I look at the investments they've made across the board and think, what an, incre you know, an incredible platform um, and what an incredible engine um, Masa and, and Steve are, um, are building uh, together. So what, what's to that? Masa most of I mean, facial recognition is, is everywhere. Everybody's talking about it. You know, Apple's going to launch this and people are getting used to it. And we talk about accuracy and level of detections and understanding really is at you. And so talk a little bit about what's unique about your technology uh, that stood out for, for a company like SoftBank. I would imagine those guys only buy the, the best and brightest, right? Yeah, well, let's hope. The, um, <laughs> so, uh, so the thing that's unique about, uh, about EverAI, we started a, um, a consumer um, uh, cloud storage company about five years ago. And, um, and we had to provide our own uh, face recognition and object recognition because there was nothing on the market that we felt uh, was adequate enough um, and certainly nothing that could operate at the same uh, scale that we were operating uh, at with any sort of reasonable um, economics behind it. And so, um, so we went about creating our own um, and it got to be um, very, quite, quite good um, as a result of um, the way that we were having uh, consumers actually tag their photos. And so rather than having, if you, if you look at sort of a lot of companies uh, out there who primarily work on the algorithms but they don't have uh, the data necessarily to support, and you really need to have both, um, you end up with, um, uh, with stuff that, that might be decently high accuracy, but not high enough accuracy that you'd want to put in a sort of production level uh, product. Um, we, uh, because of the approach that we took, we have uh, nearly for every single uh, uh, person that's in that database, we never sell that data to anybody, so SoftBank and none of our other customers have access to that data, but they were able to tag 200 uh, people deep on average. Um, and what comes out of that are 200 photos per person on average that we have of that, of that face. Um, when you take 200 photos per person, and these are photos and videos that have been taken by consumers, um, so they're all lovely, sort of different uh, varying levels of accuracy. Um, and so the, uh, the models that come out the, um, the other side of our neural nets end up being uh, really quite robust to things like occlusion, uh, blurriness, uh, brightness, uh, different levels of, uh, of lighting conditions. Um, because consumer photos, uh, when taken on average, are really not, not really that good. Um, they're obviously getting better, but um, with some of the more recent technology. But we have this large database to draw upon, and that's that's really what makes. But they're it. pretty static too, right? I mean, you're looking at now when paper. Tell me about how important vision is, right? We're talking about you know literally bringing AI into the context of vision to recognize people. It's literally real time motion. Yeah, we're going from picture to videos here, and and to which extent. So where are you pushing that? Are you going to try to detect intent beyond identity? Yeah, I mean, we've got a lot of places that we're taking the technology. I mean, everything as you know, as simple as uh, liveness detection. So is this a um, is this a real person that's uh, that's in front of me, which becomes incredibly important in authentication use cases. Um, everything from uh, from liveness to um, to blowing out our object recognition uh, in the next couple of quarters here. Um, we've had that object recognition for a long time, but we uh, in our consumer applications, but we haven't productized it yet. Um, so that's you know we're looking forward to that, um, as well as emotion detection and making sure that the the sort of conversational commerce that uh, that Steve was talking about, where you're recognizing the intent of the of the human, uh, becomes. Um, uh, becomes the thing that is that difference maker uh, between uh, making a, a humanoid robot even more human. I mean, Steve, you talk about trust, right? So I think if you think about embedded other kind of partners out there, um, e-commerce, massive. Obviously, you have some backgrounds there and doing a ton of work there. Are there other areas and other startups that are in the audience that are building companies that how they think about approaching you? What are some of the things that they might be interested? Uh, in, in coming to you with and different verticals maybe or yeah, I think uh, you know we, we try to start first with what's what's the client's need like we, we can prescribe things but that's not the way you're successful so 
we start with what are the needs. Um, so if I think about hospitality, one of the issues is they need to know their customer. Know your customer, right? That's not a, a new phrase. If I walk into a Hyatt, I should be able to be recognized. And so you know, we, we have a unique platform to engage with that person as they walk into a Hyatt. If I can recognize them on top of that, boy, I've fundamentally changed the interaction and experience they've had in the lobby. So the question really is, is not that I have a specific answer so much as you know, what, what are you all solving or what are the co companies out there solving that would make sense on a platform like a, a Pepper or another robot that we have. And, and that would be the ones that we'd want to engage with. We knew that facial recognition was important. We knew that uh, conversational UX is the, the backbone of this. Um, so now things like intent, gesture, you know, how do we better understand what that person is trying to communicate? Um, you know, dialogue flow was great for us because it brings the depth of, an, of a very specific experience onto the platform so we don't have to code it out. So if somebody already has a chatbot, we can just bring it onto the platform and now it's an expert in that one area immediately. So those are the kinds of things that we're looking to bring onto the platform to up-level that experience. Right, and I think, yeah, I mean, yeah, this experience started with, practically speaking, how fast we're able to implement and test your technology on the platform. Yeah, I don't know. We can we can talk to. I think the the competence of the engineering team at SoftBank Robotics was a, a sort of a key piece of that. But um, we had their uh, their crew up and running in I think about 15 to 30 minutes yeah. uh, when they sort of dropped their um, our uh, Docker container in and uh, and they were ready to go. Um, now, obviously, the the hard part. Um, you know, I would say that we we've done a lot of hard part on from an engineering perspective on the AI side, but the hard part is taking that. Um, that technology and actually uh, creating delightful user experiences out of it. And so, um, you know, we've been partnered with them throughout the entire thing, um, throughout the entire process, and I think it's it's gone quite well. I mean, maybe Steve. <laughs> it's gone quite well. Except for, except except for me, everything else good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Everything else good, right? Um, so yeah, and, and you know, looking at that as, uh, as an example of how we look, uh, work with other partners, um, you know, everything from uh, banking uh, to uh, retail and hospitality, where we're pretty closely with uh, Steve's team uh, on that, to, um, uh, to different uh, surveillance type scenarios uh, that, that our technology is starting to be embedded in those uh, types of scenarios as well. So, you know, a lot of people talk about data and privacy and opt-in and everything else. I'm not going to go there really, but um, <laughs> thinking about that platform, I mean, you know, I'm looking at this as like, this is a massive play working with some partners that are so much rich. And, and you, know, you ask yourself, okay, what are some of the things that we're going to discover? And this personalization you're talking about, um, how fast are we going to see it? It's all about building trust at the end, right? Because I, I really love that part you said. This is how do I gain trust right away into my first interaction with something? And we've all been wandering around, whether it's you know the commerce or store experience, right? All wandering around, where is this product or which aisle? And of course, they switch all the time because they don't want you to walk around the whole door. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I think. You know, tell us a little bit. So, I, I see that vision. I see w how, at what speed you see that being adopted by the market. What do you hear from the, your customers out there? I, I think the key is not trying to be all things to all people. We we have a robot right now. It was really good in certain settings, not all settings. And so, being very choiceful in where we we uh, work the robot, which clients we take on, where what kind of problems we solve, uh, becomes key. Um, and then we're going to learn from the pitfalls of the other areas of the industries that have already learned these lessons. So e-commerce is a good example. Like, we, we should shame on us if we repeat their their issues. So, I think um, you know we're going to be very uh, thoughtful about the the data we collect. We're going to partner with good partners who have their act together on that front, um, and that hopefully starts to create a good experience, which is the the foundation for that trust you're you're referring to. But I think when you try to overextend yourself is when you get and you get exposed, trouble. yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I think I was I use that as an example. I so, said, look, you know, it's not so much that Gmail product is much better than Yahoo or Hotmail per se, really, but the ecosystem they have around it is just mind blowing in the sense that I get so much value out of the partners that are surrounding that core platform. And I think you know what what SoftBank is doing, SoftBank Robotics, is really offering an opportunity to build an ecosystem around that that would make the company even more valuable. And as venture capitalists, you know. Standing here very small next to SoftBank, we're still very excited about the opportunity to give unfair advantage for companies. So knowing that you can actually validate and taste quickly, you know, within a 30 minute you know, integration into the platform of, of SoftBank Robotic is actually quite exciting. So it was really privileged to have you both on stage to talk about that dynamic and, and where we're taking the experience going forward and thinking again, robotic has sensors, 
that extension, right? Putting the dots together, um, pretty phenomenal. So again, thank you so much. Please join me in welcome and thanking the panels for joining us today. And it will be And I get to stay on stage a little bit longer because I think the transition, yes, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, we have uh, Richard Sarcher um, at Research at AI that's going to be presenting next. So it's going to give us a bit of a wrap up around the state of AI um, today from his viewpoint. And, you know, he gets to do a lot of very exciting and interesting things. So I think it's uh, my privilege and pleasure to introduce you, Richard Sarcher, on stage as soon as they take that away from us. <laughs> Thank you, Richard, for being with us. Here we are. Hello, everybody, and uh, thanks for sticking around to the end. Super excited to be here today to tell you a little bit about the state of the art uh, of AI uh, as we see it today, and maybe give you a little bit uh, of a look into the future. Uh, whenever we look into the future, and you know, we want to understand why is everybody so excited about AI, uh, we actually believe uh, at Salesforce and a lot of other companies that. We're at the brink, or maybe even in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution. And when you look at the previous industrial revolution, they really significantly changed how humanity operated, what most people did most of their day. And when in 1969, people asked, oh, what's the future going to be in like 40 years? And they asked the experts at the time, maybe the professors who sent the first TCP IP packages uh, across the first version of the internet, the ARPANET, um, zero people at the time, none of the experts at the time, could have predicted that 40 years later we'd have a social media Twitter marketing manager position. <laughs> and just like that, when I'm asked, oh, what's the future, the long-term future of AI, uh, it's really hard for me to really go that far out, because the internet will have a, uh, less of an impact than AI uh, will have on the future of humanity. And so we need to have a little bit of humility in how far out uh, we can predict the future. But what is clear is that there's also uh, some amount of hype. And so I want to point out to this really great quote here uh, from 1958 in the New York Times uh, when Rosenblatt, Frank Rosenblatt, uh, just invented the perceptron. And the perceptron is indeed the first basic building block of neural networks, the same kinds of neural networks that nowadays are giving us all the huge advances in AI. And at the time, they were already very excited about that thing, and they often gave uh, estimates of maybe 10, 20 years uh, back then uh, about these kinds of algorithms being conscious of their own existence, talk, see, write, reproduce themselves, and so on. And so there's currently no credible research path for self-conscious AI. So despite me being extremely excited about AI, I'm not worried about the self-conscious, self-goal-setting AI because we don't really know even what the missing pieces are. Some people think, oh, but computers will get so fast, we'll have enough neurons to model the human brain. Well, we already have enough neurons to model an ant brain, and we still don't have as good robotic control as ants. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a little bit more complicated, but it is also the case that we have made a lot of progress in some of the other verbs like talking, seeing, and writing, and I'll show you a little bit what those will look like soon. So again, whenever you talk about such a hype-induced subject like artificial intelligence, it's good to look back at like what the basic definition is of AI. And the tricky bit with that is often that it's actually moving. As soon as we solve something, we don't call it AI anymore. <laughs> In fact, uh, it started with you know, research and folks who worked and looked at each other and said, oh, we're really smart. What can we do really well? And they could play chess really well, they could memorize things really well, they could do math really well. But of course, the computers can already do that. And a lot of the technology that came out of doing that, like playing chess or even playing Go, isn't really that helpful because in game playing, you can play a billion times. If you wanted to use an algorithm that you used to learn how to play Go in medicine, you would first kill maybe a couple billion people, and then you could <laughs> solve some hard medical issues. So, the real world can't, unfortunately, be sampled and played against each other billions of times. Not even language uh, can do that. And so, uh, basically, 
we have to look at some functions that we used to not even consider uh, that hard, but they were actually incredibly hard, and now we've solved them thanks to deep learning, such as speech recognition. And now we just call it speech recognition or Siri on the phone. Nobody's like, oh my god, it's so amazing. Like, what's the weather in Palo Alto today? And it'll just write it correctly, even with a lot of background noise and different accents and so on. To me, that's still incredible. Every time I say something complicated, I'm like, look, it's, it actually works. Because even five, ten years ago, that was not the case. Um, but nobody says, oh wow, this amazing AI, look at it. it, it still works. It's just speech recognition now, and that's one of these examples of the moving definition of what AI really is. Uh, another area other than speech recognition where we've made a lot of progress as a community since around 2012 or so is an image understanding and generally in computer vision. And the main idea behind that is an end-to-end -end deep learning models. And what do I mean by end-to-end? -end? It's basically the idea of taking in raw input and having a lot of training examples of some raw input such as pixels and an output that you'd like to predict. And in this case here, you've trained, uh, the first kind of big breakthrough came from training on ImageNet, where we had 1,000 classes and 1,000 representative examples for each of those <coughs> visual classes, like cat, dog, house, car, and things like that. And once you have enough training data, you can train everything from these are the raw pixels to this is a cat. And instead of having humans come up with, well, cats have whiskers and feet and eyes and tails and things like that, uh, you let the algorithm figure out what are all the intermediate representations that you need to understand each visual category. And that idea of end-to-end -end deep learning models has been really, really powerful, and in some cases has even some neurological plausibility. So what you see here, for instance, on the left, uh, these edge blobs, turns out they're also uh, neurons in your brain and your visual cortex that fire when they see certain edges. And there are other neurons that fire other textures and things like that. And so all of these intermediate representations are automatically learned, and that's really, really powerful, because now if you want to classify sheet metal inconsistencies in your manufacturing process, you can use that same algorithm to also classify that. And in fact, there are a lot of other advances that we've made, so before we go into applications, I want to show you a couple of other really cool things that you can now do where we connect computer vision even to natural language processing, we can, for instance, describe images with much more than just a single class. So here you see an algorithm, and in the color coding you see where the algorithm is focusing on in an image while it's generating a specific word. So we can't not just say this is like a human, we can actually say this is a little girl sitting on a bench holding an umbrella. And while it's actually generating the word girl, it is indeed focusing on the girl to generate that word. So this is a very recent paper uh, from last year uh, from my research group. Another amazing new feat of computer vision combined with natural language processing is visual question answering, where we can ask quite complex natural language questions about an image. So we can, for instance, ask, what is the pattern on the cat's fur and its tail? And on the right here, you see where the algorithm is focusing its attention on as it is trying to answer that question. What's amazing, it's actually focusing a lot of its attention on that uh, tail and then correctly answers stripes. And when you look into this and you do some error analysis, which every good AI researcher will do on their development set, then you'll realize, well, the algorithm is actually only around 10 in the beginning and now about 20% better than just looking at the question and predicting the answer without seeing the image. And what that tells you is it captures the priors of language. So if I ask you what's the color of the banana, you can close your eyes and you can say yellow, and you'd probably still be right 90% of the time. Uh, but here we found a couple of examples where it is actually able to overrule that language prior. So what color are the bananas in this picture here on the top right? It actually it focuses on the bananas and realizes those are not quite right yet, and actually correctly answers with green. So it's clearly learning a lot of things, and as long as you have enough training data of here's an input, namely an image and a question, and here's an output, namely the answer to that pair, then you can learn to do this for new kinds of images. But not for new kinds of domains. There's, uh, there's still a lot of work to do. If you never show it a tennis image, 
it won't be able to answer more complex questions like has the player hit the ball already or will it, is it about to hit the ball and things like that. It still needs training data for each domain to work well. Now, there are some real applications for computer vision in industry, and we're seeing a huge explosion in the last couple of years of startups that are focusing uh, on specific verticals. So you can have, for instance, this is a billion dollar industry in the United States that people walk around supermarkets, take pictures, and then other people mark up the pictures and say where they see which products. And you can automate a lot of that, and instead of uh, having to manually mark each time you see specific kind of beverage or something, or cornflakes or whatever it is, you can actually have an algorithm identify the products and where they are on the shelves, which can help with automatic inventory management uh, and also with marketing and knowing where your product's actually located. Because uh, if you don't see something in the store, it's unlikely to get bought. You can also have some really impactful applications uh, in oncology and uh, specifically pathology. Uh, full disclosure, I've invested in the startup um, that basically offers a test that used to cost a couple hundred dollars, and it can offer it now, instead of it taking several days and costing a couple hundreds of dollars, it can offer it for a few dollars and give you a response in just a couple of minutes. And the test here in particular is counting red and white blood cells in a blood sample, which is super helpful for a couple of different uh, cancer treatments, like leukemia and other kinds of infectious diseases. And so it's super helpful and streamlines that process, but of course it understands, like they also understand the workflow. It's not just the AI. The AI only works well because they've collected a lot of trained data, fear plus samples in. This is how many uh, red and white blood cells you see in that sample. You train that, and then instead of having a human sit there and count each time, you can automate that process with, uh, again, end to end trainable deep learning models. I think in general, we will see a lot of improvements in radiology which is a perfect example of image in, output out, and having a lot of training data for that exact mapping. And so it's kind of surprising to a lot of people because radiology is a job that takes eight to 10 plus years to train for. Uh, and that might actually be easier to automate to some degree. We won't automate all of it. There will always be new kinds of diseases and so on. So we do need radiologists still. Uh, but we can offer a much higher level of service, very fast turnaround, very quick support for radiologists to not miss anything, going through previous scans of uh, populations and so on, uh, and really improve the whole field of radiology. All right, so we've covered natural language processing and speech recognition. Now I'll just have one slide on robotics. Uh, and this is starting with a video from uh, the DARPA Grand Challenge in 2015. Uh, where they asked to have these robots, several of which cost uh, quite significant amounts of money, um, to navigate completely autonomously over different environments, different obstacles, different types of uh, ground, <laughs> of sand, staircases, different, uh, different obstacles they have to open doors to, so find the doorknob, turn around, walk through it. Uh, and as you can see, in 2015, that did not work uh, so well. And in fact, it hasn't really changed that much. Uh, fully autonomous robotics is still incredibly hard and to combine a lot of different skills, visual skills and so on. And uh, is, there, is it pretty hilarious. I, I, I do enjoy this video. That's why I keep, keep having it in there on the scaba. Um, and so it's really, really hard uh, to do this, and in many ways we're still behind the level of a honeybee even when it comes to complex motor control. Uh, but you also have videos like this one uh, that just came out a couple months ago, and you think, wow, Richard was uh, totally lying. In fact, there's some funny YouTube comments uh, on one of my talks where he was like, I only presented the left video, and people was like, what is he trying to hide? Um, so this one is a video from Boston Dynamics and uh, ends with this amazing backflip and that looks very, very different. Uh, but what you don't see is that there's a person behind the camera with a remote control. So this is not fully autonomous robotics. Uh, but they have figured out a lot of the lower level dynamics to actually make it stabilized and stand and walk and jump and things like that. But it doesn't make autonomous decisions. So again, we're still pretty far away despite making a lot of progress, we're still pretty far away from any of those fun sci-fi scenarios of Terminator. 
Uh, in fact, what I think is the most interesting manifestation of human intelligence is actually natural language processing. If you think about it, it actually is connected to all the other things that we do. Uh, it's also connected to thought, uh, which is pretty important. And when you close your eyes and you think about running, you can actually, your motor cortex will fire too. So thinking and language connect all the other parts of the brain and it's very distributed and complex kind of machinery of which we also have a lot less understanding than the visual cortex, for instance, uh, in, in neuroscience. And so there are a bunch of interesting applications, uh, several of which have huge amounts of industries and impact behind them. And I'm not mentioning the obvious ones like advertising and search, which show you that NLP is already the kind of technology that has had a lot more impact than pretty much all of other AI combined in terms of uh, GDP and things like that. So it is still also really hard to do it perfectly, though we are making a lot of progress. In 2011, uh, people found that whenever Anne Hathaway started a movie, reviews came out, were positive, the stocks for the company Berkshire Hathaway keep going up every time. Start a movie, good reviews, stock went up. Uh, and so this is what we call entity disambiguation problem. And those still persist as you're trying to solve a lot of very general kinds of problems. Uh, but we have made a lot of progress. So this is an output uh, of uh, an algorithm uh, that my group and I developed um, two years ago. And those are examples that no previous algorithm had correctly classified before, but now the latest uh, of deep learning algorithms can actually accurately identify the right sentiment for these sentences. So the first one is, in its ragged, cheap, and unassuming way, the movie works. So despite being cheap and unassuming and so on, this is actually a positive sentence because the movie makes it work. The second one, the best way to hope for any chance of enjoying this film is by lowering your expectations. Also, really tough because traditional machine learning algorithms would say, well, it's got best and hope and chance and enjoying, how bad could it be? Uh, but then you only get to those once you lower your expectations a lot, and this new algorithm can actually do this accurately. So, Quite exciting. Uh, another major breakthrough of last year was that we can now, with again an end-to-end -end trainable deep learning model, which actually also uses some reinforcement learning, uh, but it's still end-to-end -end trainable, can create summaries of longer documents. And the summarization is still a really tough research problem. This is a particularly good example. They don't all look that good. But uh, the main problem is often the training data. Do we have enough training data and we need ideally hundreds of thousands of summaries about certain domains? <coughs> and once you have that, you can build algorithms that can summarize longer documents into shorter ones and actually generate multiple coherent sentences, which was not possible up until last year. The last application uh, and research area that NLP uh, is really excited about, the community of NLP is really excited about, is question answering. And that, of course, is also extremely helpful. Instead of giving just a list of websites that might include your answer, you give the exact answer phrase. And that can be used in service. It can be used in chatbots as a subcomponent, where you can allow your chatbots now to ask questions over FAQ sites or knowledge base articles and things like that. So I think in general, we'll see AI augmenting a lot of different kinds of human and informational work. Uh, there's another fun example where you can look at what lawyers are doing, and instead of them spending an hour a day keeping track of how they spend the rest of their day, you can just, based on what they're typing and what documents they're working on, automate that for them. And an hour a day for a lawyer means a lot of money per year for a law firm. So just automating those kinds of things and taking away the, the sort of boring parts of your job, I think will be overall very rewarding. Now, you might ask what you need to make AI work for your own company, and uh, we don't have quite enough time to really go into that. Uh, so I'm just gonna tell you that you gotta think about your data, your algorithms, and your workflows. And in most cases, there's a huge amount of engineering work necessary to get your data all in the right place and have it labeled and basically get it into a format where you have a certain kind of input associated with a certain kind of output that you want to predict. And if you have that, then you're in a really good place because the algorithms, if you use standard, if you have standard kinds of problems, are actually in many ways getting commoditized. The open source uh, community is great and the AI community works a lot open sourcing the ideas uh, in papers and even in code, 
So unless you try to solve a new kind of problem, your algorithms might not be the problem. And of course, your product teams need to really carefully think through where to actually embed the AI in a general workflow. And so that, I'm going to end with some high-level future thoughts, uh, which I don't think are actually that crazy. So I think food and basic necessities like housing and safety could actually be automated with AI. Uh, if we, you know, it's not, we're not going to give you like the latest iPad or something <laughs> with AI, but if you just want food, shelter, and things like that, in theory, with the right political structure, AI could offer that to everybody. Uh, so if we're still people uh, suffering hunger in the next couple of decades is really a political problem and not a technology problem anymore. Uh, I think human intelligence uh, and productivity will get enhanced and in the end we'll have to focus more and more on unique creative and empathetic tasks where you want actually a human to be interacting uh, with you. You don't want an algorithm to do certain things. And the last word is that uh, AI is really only as good as the training data that we give it. And so if your training data is sexist or racist or any other problem uh, that you might have in your training data that is collected based on human actions, then your algorithms will just take that in and amplify it or reuse it and replicate that kind of behavior. So it's important that we're thinking about diversity both in terms of the kinds of problems that we work on and the kinds of people that are working on these problems as well as the data sets that the algorithms are trained. Algorithms are always neutral. The image classification algorithm that I've shown you to classify breast cancer or blood samples, it can also have a label of shoot, not shoot. There's nothing inherent that we can force these algorithms to not ever do because they just take in their training data and do basically replicate the kinds of patterns that they see there. So hopefully as AI is getting applied to more and more industries, each of these industries like transportation or medicine will have to think about how to regulate it, but it doesn't really make sense to regulate it as an overall thing, just like it's hard to regulate all of computers or all of hammers, because those can also all be used for good and bad. So hopefully it's up to you to think about all the positive use cases and make AI uh, improve the state of the world. Thank you. Well, um, we're getting to the end of the day here, and we're going to wrap it up, I promise, pretty shortly. Uh, I don't know what it was like for you. For us, it's been a rush. It's been amazing to have all these people on stage with us and sharing with you some of the latest things they are doing at the forefront. Um, sometimes it feels like we are really hyperbolic and there's massive hype in the space. But at the same time, you know, there's some real changes happening, and sometimes it's, it's happening faster than you can think of. It's just happening behind the scene. And so, you know, I think as investors in the space, we see a lot, and that's part of the patterns recognition. But uh, we wanted to wrap up the session here with a few highlights, which I'll turn over to Nikolai, um, you know, about what happened today, and then just like tell you a little bit where things are going in our minds. Uh, thank you, Ben, um, and thank you for keeping the show running here on stage all day. Um, so I want to thank all of you to, for coming today and making part of. What I personally think was a very successful event. Um, I'm very biased, of course, but a lot of you guys told me in between the sessions today that you've been pretty excited about what happened today. Uh, so I'm the really glad. The, the coffee is the best part, which <laughs> is uh, our resident Italian, Luigi, is the one that makes sure that we have real coffee, of course. He keeps our standard pretty high. <laughs> In the comments, we did the coffee, the real coffee last year, we did it this year, we're going to do it next year, it's not going to go away. Um, so if anything, come back for coffee. Yeah, if, if nothing else. Um, but again, very excited about the day. Uh, it's been great for me, and I hope it's, as I said, for you as well. Uh, very excited. And, and I know we're standing between you and alcohol, um, and I grew up in Sweden, and then and you don't want to stand between the Swedes and alcohol for sure. <laughs> um, but anyway, so a few highlights of, 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 of what we talked about today. I think one of the things, um, I want to touch a little bit on the ending notes from, uh, from Richard, which was we should not regulate AI. And the reason for that is that it's a generic technology. We need to look at where it's applied and how that matters. 
And today there's starting to be talk about, need it, is it dangerous to be regulated? Uh, so, so dangerous should be regulated, right? Maybe it is, maybe where it's applied. But I think to, for, to what Paul said er, uh, early this morning was that AI is not a vertical, it's not one thing. It's like we've seen with other technologies like the internet and computers, it's an alpha trend. It will transcend everything and it will shape everything. Um, I don't think that's important to remember. That's what we care about. That's what we think is so big. We think this is really the fourth wave of industrial revolution. Um, but it also needs to apply in something that matters, which is why we talk about applied AI. Right? Well, um, believe, it, believe it or not, three years ago, it was all AI. Nobody talked about applied AI and for us as investors to say, look, unless it's being applied, practically speaking, in the next three to five years, it doesn't matter, right, from an adventure investment standpoint. Yeah, and I think that's going back to how we talk internally, when we talk about the conference, there are three pillars that we build the content and thinking around this, and it's, it's how AI is impacting people, organizations, and society as a whole. Um, and we try to build content and narrative and, and what we do with during this conference around those things. I want to mention a few other things, and these are some of the verticals that we really care about where we see a lot of uh, exciting things happening with AI. So the future of work, uh, somebody said that human work will focus, will shift to creative topics engaging with humans, so the communication between humans and the creativity. I mean, this is important to remember that AI is, is highly disruptive, but it doesn't mean we're going to replace humans. But as we've seen with every other technology in the past, over 100 years of, of innovation and industrialization is that it shifts the job, jobs you do. It also shifts very clearly to increased specialization. And there are things with AI that we never could even think about having computers and machines to do, but they're also going to be able to augment to do things that humans never could do. And that combination, we believe, is extremely powerful augmenting human capability. Right? Uh, so that's what we think the future work is going to be a lot about. We talked a little bit about energy, and, and I think I'm, I'm repeating a little bit what I said uh, on stage then, uh, to, together with Thomas uh, from energy, uh, is that energy, it's you know electricity. We're so used to it just working. right? But we're shifting dramatically how it's generated, where it's generated, how we consume it, that this is actually becoming really complex problems, which actually need AI um, to be able to both be cost effective and reliable, um, and actually secure. Uh, there is threats from different actors that can disrupt the grids, and there's a lot of issues around this, really important for our society. And another area, sounds like I'm, I'm very dystopian here, well, you're always anticipating the next slide. I'm wondering if you're AI powered, but. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, let's talk about cybersecurity. Uh, so, Penn talked a little bit about how passwords are not enough. Um, and, I don't know. Uh, to me, the past two years, from data breaches with Equifax to an election or two or things around the world, uh, I think it's pretty apparent that we need to live in a world where even. Things like social media that we find, might not think is as point and secure as our bank accounts or other things, they actually, when you don't know who is actually impacting them, when you don't know what person really is behind attributing and behind what's going on, it can be abused, really, with really severe consequences, right? This is really important. Um, and again, it's also a complex problem where as we are seeing it, we already invested in companies like PIN, which are using AI to be able to do that and achieve that. Right? Well, I love the part where you don't have to memorize your PIN and change it every two weeks. Yeah. Well, I don't like a password. You know, if the systems just know it's me, that's fine. Right? Um, and then I think I want to touch on the last point uh, that uh, Dr. Jane McFarlane spoke about, is that, you know, we're increasingly going to a world where we're talking about um, autonomous transportation. We're talking about, uh, we, we, have a, we, have, we have, the cities of the world are becoming, you know, we're almost, you know, there's a migration into the cities. 200,000 people move into cities every day around the world. Yeah. 200,000. We're moving more and more into cities and urban areas. 
and so it's going to get worse, not better, unless we solve this problem. And if you lived in Bay Area for, for, for the past 10 years, you probably think about this more or less every day, driving up and down 101. It just gets worse and worse and worse, right? So it's a long story short, uh, to solve some of these major infrastructure problems, and from energy to actually moving people and things around, um, right now we're sitting on data silos where Apple has one part of its data set to be able to solve some real problems around this and the, the decades of planning with that the transport authorities does, the like Caltrans of California and others, and, and, and Google sits on another one, and the, the Department of Transportation is on yet another one. Uh, building better collaboration between both public and private, I think that's going to be crucial across the board to be able to you know, keep innovating and having a society that's thriving with everything that's happening. Um, and I think I'm still on topic, oh. I think the... <laughs> Let's go back to this, sorry. No, it's good. No, no, it's fine. Um, you went to Google, so I mean, look, recently the CEO of Google said this is one of the most fundamental technology out there, maybe as, as impactful as fire or electricity. Uh, and then, of course, you know, everybody loves to quote that guy, which is, hey, by the way, yeah, this is, this is amazing, and by the way, it's got to be actually as worse than nukes, mark my words. Um, and I think, you know, of course the media loves it because they, they want to feed on that and they want to remind people that, you know, like, I think like Richard Sasha said best, he said, look, technology is neutral. Yeah. It is what we make of it that turns it into good or evil. And, and I think, you know, we think a lot about that, um, you know, earlier and, you know, to maybe wrap up around that, it's like, you know, Paul mentioned uh, and Accenture said, look, you know, 38% productivity improvement uh, and, and trillions of dollars of impact to the economy. I mean, we're not talking small numbers. Um, so it would matter to a lot of people. But I think, interestingly, you, the conversation here, the fact that you are here, you know, for the first time, I think people are a lot more excited and intrigued and careful about how we deploy this technology than prior technology. I don't think you have seen the same level of engagement of people around the mobile or the internet itself. So actually, I take that as a good thing, and I think, you know, uh, we still really care about bringing people together. So, like Nikolai said, we just don't know yet what the impact of that new technology is going to be on people, organization, and society. Uh, but what we do know is that unless we bring it forth in front of you, and we have this conversation openly and telling you what works, what doesn't work, what are the challenges, and we're not going to move forward in a way that is positive. Uh, but like Nikolai said, if you think about society today, Everything is digitalizing, and I mean everything. Every single sector, every single aspect of your lives, every single businesses, and, and that also means that it becomes more vulnerable as well. Because again, it's not been built and designed from the ground up to be secured in a way that we would expect things in the physical world to be secured, right? And so, you know, of course in San Francisco I couldn't help myself to quote this. <laughs> With great powers come great responsibilities. You need a quote from Spider-Man. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and Richard, you know, he almost stole the closing here, but uh, you know, we really think alike, and we're so privileged to, to be friend and having him on stage, you know, several years in a row with us, actually, I think he's done all three conferences. Um, but we are the architects of our future. Don't look to point the fingers at others. What are you doing? We're all designing our futures. The founders out there design the futures. And, and so, like Nikolai said, let's not go build a world where we pit machines against humans. This is not the world that I want my children to grow up in. This is not the world I want to invest in. You know, let's build a world where we actually have human augmented machines, where you know, maybe they would do 80% of the work tomorrow, from 20% today to 80%, and we do the rest. But that doesn't mean that they do everything and we do the rest. It means that we're collaborating together and do things that we couldn't do before. So, and, 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 and to jump in on that, right? It's, it's, and it's not only there's a moral and ethic piece of this, but it's also what we, we've seen already in our portfolio of, of AI companies is that this augmentation of humans, the combination of having machines do what they do best with AI and having humans do what they do best and combine that in a very deliberate um, an efficient way actually creates orders of magnitudes in scale and quality output, right? So, so bottom line, you build more successful, more valuable companies if you figure out how to do this well as well. 
So I'm sure you were not expecting a quote from Michael Jackson, but <laughs> if you think about it... Well, we've got yeah. Spider-Man, we've got a Michael Jackson. Well, you know, it's like, if you want to make the world a better place, just, you know, take a look at, at yourself and make a change. And I think that was such powerful lyrics. And, 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 you know, in the context of venture capitalists, we say, well, we kind of have the same, but we play it a bit differently. We say, you know what? If you see a founder that's investing in the future you want to see in the world, invest in them, right? Because ultimately, people are changing the future by making it happen now. And so with that, you know, at Bootstrap Lab, we just happen to be uncovering the future by investing in a player. Yeah. And with that, thank you so much. And let's go have a drink next Thank day. you, guys. Big, big thank you to everybody. Yeah, we don't mind. Okay, so we also want to, you know, a big thank you to the rest of the team. So I can take no credit for this amazing conference. Ben has been amazing today. Luigi, Mark, Ed, and, and Dana, Dana and Kevin, and, 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 and the whole production so team. All of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, Michael, uh, what did you think of the conference? It was amazing to me. To me, it was uh, an amazing conference. A lot of great people convening, a lot of information in one day. Yeah. And uh, lots to learn about how AI is going to affect everything uh, that we do and how we live and how work uh, operates and businesses. So, well, I'm glad, same I'm glad here. I attended. Same here. I enjoyed uh, meeting you. Thank yeah. you. A pleasure to meet you.